Elphinstone and I will be chairing the committee this evening. In the event of an emergency and the sounding of an alarm, the emergency evacuation procedure is to leave by the nearest exit. Anyone requiring assistance should remain in their seats and an officer will be able to assist you from the building. Whilst restrictions have been eased, I strongly recommend that face masks continue to be worn in the meeting venue unless exempt. We have ensured good ventilation. I'm hoping it might be a bit less ventilation because it's a bit chilly down here um, in this venue. And I urge you to maintain a degree of social distancing. Anybody in the public gallery or watching at home who wishes to follow the agenda from their tablet or smartphone can do that. Do so by going to www.kingston.gov.uk and follow the links from your council on the home page. This meeting is being filmed for live broadcast on the Council's YouTube channel and an archived version will be available to view on the channel after the meeting finishes. The broadcast will be suspended during any adjournments in proceedings and if the committee resolves to consider information as exempt business. Members are reminded that microphones must be switched on and spoken into clearly for the broadcast. And if I can ask everybody to speak directly into the um, microphone... Um, and please, could everyone present in the meeting also ensure that their mobile phones are switched off or in silent mode for the duration of this meeting? I will start, um, I'll start round the room with councillors, if I may, uh, members of this committee, um, and if you could uh, introduce yourselves. So um, if I go round this way first, so um, Councillor Thailand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, my name is Ty Talon, and uh, I'm a councillor for Tolworth and Hook Race Ward. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, Andreas Kirsch, councillor for Chessington South and Morden Washard. Good evening, councillor Steph Archer, and I represent Chessington North and Hook. Good evening, councillor Dennis Goodship, representing Tolworth and Hook Rise. Good evening, it's Andrew McKinley representing uh, Chessington South and Malden Russia. Good evening, Councillor Christine Stewart, representing Chessington South and Malden Russia. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Margaret Thompson, representing uh, Chessington North and Hook. Hello, I'm, my microphone doesn't work or it hasn't got a light on. It oh, it is, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Councillor Sharon Young, Chessington North and Hook. Thank you, councillors. Uh, we also have uh, officers in attendance who will present the reports this evening. Uh, so on to housekeeping. Before commencement of the substantive agenda items, I'd like to propose a change in order by moving agenda item two, petitions to go after agenda items, presentation of recognition of service to the community and the policing update. So the certificate recipients and, uh, and Sergeant um, Henderson may leave this meeting for the more substantive, substantive items. Uh, can I ask members to, if that's okay with you? That's all right, is that great? Thank you very much indeed. And in the agenda items to be discussed tonight, whilst we would be very much welcome participation by members of the public, I am mindful of the importance that comments and questions should remain respectful to each other and we would listen to each other's viewpoints. Members of the public can only make comments or questions at the meetings, but not a visual presentation by computer. So we'll go to item one, uh, public questions. Um, we have a period of no more than 30 minutes during any resident of the borough or representative of organisations operating within the borough other than members of the council may ask questions on matters relevant to the committee. We like to encourage questions to be submitted in advance so that officers have an opportunity to answer them, although it's not absolutely necessary. Um, at this session, I know we had a couple of um, questions on the Tolworth Road neighbourhood scheme um, and Clayton Road parking arrangements, which will be handed, um, handled at the respective agenda items, so as to make the discussion more focused. I understand we don't have any, um, uh, uh, any public questions this evening, so we'll move on um, to um, item two, apologies for absence. Herman, do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, thank you, Chair. We don't have apologies. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, item three um, is declarations of interest. Members are invited to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests and any non-pecuniary interests or personal interests relevant to the items on the agenda. Do any members have, have any, any interest they wish to declare? No? no. Thank you very much. Item four um, is the minutes. Um, do members agree to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of January as a correct record? Great, lovely, thank you. Um, so I'll sign those minutes. Thank you very thank you. much. Um, so we'll go to um, the presentation in recognition of service to the community. Earlier in the municipal year, South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee agreed to set up a community award. Tonight, the committee will present certificates to two staff members of the council in recognition of their service to the community, particularly in our neighbourhood. So I'll now invite the vice chair of the committee, Councillor Tai Thailand, to, to introduce um, the uh, recipients. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's my pleasure to read out this evening the citations for two South of the Borough Community commendations to be awarded on behalf of the Neighbourhood Committee by the Chair, Councillor Lorraine Dunson. The award is given to those who are not able to receive a Mayor's Award due to them being employed by the Council, but where the Committee felt very strongly that the excellent contribution of the two recipients over a number of years should not go unnoticed. Chair, the first person to receive the South of Borough Community Commendation is Mr. Martin Constable. Martin, as many of you will be aware, has been the school crossing patrol officer at Moor Lane for some time. His first day patrolling the school crossing was the 6th of June 2009. Come rain, shine, or even sometimes in the snow, Martin has been ever present, keeping our children safe, both at the start and at the end of the school day. Amazingly, given the average number of school days in a year, this means that Martin has conducted his school crossing patrol on around 9,000 occasions. He always has a wave and a smile for the children, parents, and drivers, and will not everyone in the neighborhood knows his name, we all know him. Chair, may I please ask you to present Mr. Martin Constable with his commendation for dedication and contribution to road safety in the South Borough neighborhood. Uh, Chair, the second person to receive the uh, South of the Borough Community Commendation is Mr. Dale Gossington. Dale has been a community ranger for just under 20 years, spending around 18 of those years supporting the communities of the South of the Borough. During his long and dedicated service, Dale has worked tirelessly to keep the neighborhood clean and tidy and free of graffiti. During the pandemic, Dale has supported the RBK COVID response by delivering urgent food parcels and medication to the most vulnerable in our neighborhood. Dale is happy to help where needed in the borough, but in short, Dale has been ever present in providing support to the South of the Borough community. Chair, may I please ask that you present Mr. Dale Gossington with his commendation for his dedication, support, and professionalism to the South of Borough community in his role as a community ranger. Thank you. 
I will just say, whilst they're all here as well, um, we've got a lot of the rangers here this evening, um, and every single one of them have worked so hard and always continue to. Um, and um, during COVID, were really called upon and stepped up to the mark. So thank you very much to all the rangers that have turned up tonight. If you want to escape, you're more than welcome to, or you're more than welcome to stay for the meeting. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Well done. So we'll move on to the community policing update. Um, this evening we've been, um, thank you very much for coming along this evening, Sergeant uh, Thomas Henderson, to give us an update on policing matters in the neighbourhood. It's the first time we've been able to come along to the neighbourhood, so we do really welcome the opportunity of meeting you and saying hello. And um, So I'll pass over to you, um, and uh, yeah, thank you. It's not... Uh not the usual radio I'm used to using, so apologies. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, nice to see all of you in person. Most of you will know me probably digitally, unfortunately, by email. Um, I haven't had the chance, hence my usual get-up, I haven't had the chance to be in uniform for a couple of months owing to some medical restrictions, so it's, it's good to finally start ebbing back into the real world. Um, today I'll only go through a, a, a few headlines uh, that I'd like to discuss with you. Um, highlight some local initiatives that we need your support on uh, and a couple of appeals there as well and direct you to some further info should you be hungry for some more information. Um, I'll go ward by ward. Uh, I am responsible for the cluster that is within the south of the borough. Um, first of all, Tolworth and Hook Rise. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we've seen a significant decrease in burglary despite our predicted trends with the seasons. And we've also seen a significant reduction in antisocial behaviour. Um, we have seen an increase in reports of drugs, be that possession and dealing. But I am pleased to say that that is a result of the team's proactivity across the ward. Um, essentially, the long story short from Home Office counting rules is that when we stop someone in a proactive manner, we generate a crime report, and that is precisely why those statistics have gone up. So it counts against us, but it's good news as far as I'm concerned that we're finding these people. Um, as far as initiatives concerned on the ward, uh, apart from that drugs proactivity, we've been doing a lot of work with trading standards here and across the borough. Uh, in regards to spot checks at shops, um, just to maintain our control of the sale of knives and make sure that everyone is adhering to their licenses as well. Chessington North, um, I'm pleased to say that burglary and ASB and drugs reports have gone down. Uh, we have started up recently a shop watch uh, in the North Parade. And on that, if you know any business owners that would like to come together to cooperate to help tackle crime in a GDPR compliant way, share information about chronic issues with particular customers, please approach your neighbourhood teams. We are happy to get that started for you. Um, we've seen some good information sharing success from the North Parade of shops. So if there are any other conglomerate of shops that you know of that would like to get involved, please let us know. Uh, as far as Chessie South is concerned, uh, we've seen a decrease in all three priority areas, all three war priorities of burglary, ASB and drugs. Uh, and you may have indeed seen some of our high-vis operations along some of the fast roads in that ward as well, um, because we've been increasing our presence and tackling traffic-related issues. Um, 
Uh, and also we've been doing high visibility patrols in more antisocial hours of darkness as a, as a use of a deterrent for any would-be catalytic converter thieves. So it's all very vehicle and traffic related our activities towards the south of the cluster. Um, as far as further information is concerned, um, the MOPAC crime dashboard is a very useful site for those of you who have access to it readily. Uh, and it gives you a more updated statistics picture of where you are. Simply type your address into the, into the address bar and it will come up with your local crime statistics as well. And we also do provide updates on those statistics and more initiatives than this that I will go into detail at your war panel meetings as well, where hopefully in the future soon, you will see me in person in a proper uniform, but you will also see your dedicated ward officers as well in person every time. We are publishing um, our community contact points regularly on our social media, the details of which I'll go into very shortly, but also we are putting notices up on notice boards as well, because that was a particular appeal from the community that that's how they would like to be notified of those contact sessions and ward panel meetings as well. So pay attention to both, whichever floats your boat, be it paper or online, we are trying to keep you all updated with as many as we, as we are. They are very regular now, the contact sessions and drop-in surgeries. And that's not just a one-way conversation of us letting you know what the crime statistics are, but it's also an opportunity to talk to your dedicated ward officers about concerns you may have that you may not necessarily feel warrant a call to 101 or 999. So go in person when they host them and they will gladly talk through, even, even civil advice as well, we can direct you in the right direction. Um, for specific appeals, um, we have seen a significant reduction in the amount of Crime Stoppers based intelligence reports, that is anonymous reports from the public telling us about local intelligence that they've seen or heard. Um, there is a, a number on the website, and there, there is a website, but there's also a free to call number. Um, I'm, I'm happy to repeat it again, and I will get it sent out to our ward contact lists, but I will say it for those of you who've got, who've got a quick pen or your phone out. It's an 0800 number, 555 That's it, so it's 0800 555 The reason why I always suggest Crime Stoppers as opposed to directly approaching your DWOs is if you would just rather stay anonymous throughout the whole process. And I'm pleased to say that we're actually developing a couple of warrants as a result of that, and we have done in the past because of those anonymous reports. It's quite easy to do, even if it just seems like a couple of lines to you, it can make the world of difference to us when we go for a warrant application, or it allows us to just get a quick picture, a snapshot of what is going on, because without those reports, we will continue our patrols with the statistics we've got, but you are vital to supporting our efforts there. Um, and that's pretty much it as far as that's concerned. Around this time, one more specific thing. We've seen a lot of really nice uh, charitable drives in regards to the issues in Ukraine. Um, and I, I, really do, I really do support that. Of course, the Metropolitan Police supports that. But more importantly on that, as with every humanitarian crisis that we see globally, there are those who might take advantage of you. So if you do have particular issues with anyone who is purporting to collect on behalf of a charity, just a quick phone call to Action Fraud um, or visit their website again for a bit more information and they can tell you there or then uh, if they are a registered charity and if not, then we can take action to stop any individuals who would take advantage of that situation. So that's pretty much as far as appeals are concerned from me. Um, uh, we do, I'm not particularly au fait with it, but we do have social media and my dedicated ward officers are very good with social media, more so than me. We do have Twitter and that's the usual at sign, NPS, and then your, your ward name. That's how you can get in touch with us on social media. We also have a Facebook page that you can quite simply search in the address bar. We are the one and only MPS Tolworth and Hook Rise, for example. And our email address is also publicly available, uh, which is your ward name, for example, it's the top one on the, on, on the uh, pile here, Tolworth and Hook Rise at met.police.uk. It's all publicly available. It's all monitored by my staff. Um, and we're here to listen to you. And again, 
If you'd want to keep it anonymous, give us a shout on Crime Stoppers. And that's pretty much it from me, Chair. Thank you, Sergeant Henderson. Has anyone on the committee got any questions at all that they'd like to ask? No? OK, fine. And then quickly, if anyone in the uh, public gallery, Mr Rob, would you like to come down? Is it already on? Yes? yes? No. Good evening. It's very nice to see you at last. Uh, there's one thing you didn't mention, and um, it's quite important to me, is Neighbourhood Watch. And uh, there's a lot of people behind me now, and this was a great opportunity to um, mention Neighbourhood Watch and ask anybody if they've got an interest in becoming a coordinator. Uh, I'm a co coordinator for uh, Bolton Road and uh, the roads around Bolton Road. But um, you see a lot of signs up around Chesington, but really, they're, they're dead. They're, they're, they're defunct um, watches. We need people to come forward and become coordinators. OK, well, in which case, there is your public appeal, absolutely. Yeah. And if people want to get that started in their particular roads, again, through those same contact channels, bring it on. Absolutely. Yeah, if they could just contact the local saving neighbourhood team. Yes. Because we're trying to get a drive going to uh, encourage people to become coordinators. Yeah, okay. I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rob. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Sergeant Henderson, for coming along this evening. It's lovely to meet you, as I say, and um, you are welcome to stay or leave as you wish. Thank you very much. So we'll move to item seven on petitions. Um, there is one petition to be received this evening, a petition gathered on the Council's e-petition system, namely Council to act to reduce the traffic on Thornhill Road due to Tolworth Road LTN, ran from 30th of December 2021 to the 2nd of March 2022 with 165 signatories. According to the petition scheme, Part 4G of the Borough's Constitution, as it, have met, as it has met the threshold of at least 0.5% of the number of registered local government electors in the neighbourhood, it will be considered at this neighbourhood committee. The petitioner, organiser Ms. Ms Liz Mitchell, will be given five minutes to present the item. Liz, did you want to come down to the front desk? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Herman will let you know when there is one minute remaining and when the time is up. All right, thank you. I'll pass to you. Right, is it, okay. Time starts now. Thank you, councillors. Uh, that petition was... Um, I was thinking about it when we got the notice that the uh, Tolworth Road posed. And I thought, when I received the first letter, I thought, well, it's a bit of a no-brainer where the traffic's going to go. It's going to go right up our street. And whilst LTNs are great, we need a solution for the whole neighbourhood. And with the increase in traffic, because it's only less than 300 metres for traffic to go to avoid Tolworth Road. It's, a real, it's not really an incentive for, enough for people. They're going to go straight down our road. And with the increase in traffic, I've got two young kids, air pollution from all the static traffic, just the whole issue of safety and more traffic going down our road, I could have predicted. And that's why I set up the petition. And sure enough, it happened. We are now seeing more and more vehicles travelling up and down our road. Uh, I now escort my two children across the road so they can ride their bikes to school safely. Don't bother escorting them the rest of the way to school. It's only across our road. So that petition was started because I could see that there were going to be problems, and there are. And we want the council to do something to mitigate the actions that were taken by this council to implement one part of a local traffic neighbourhood for our road, neighbourhood being the key word here. As you can see, uh, we achieved some milestone. I don't know what that means. Um, but we would really like 
something to be done to mitigate the traffic in our road because it's, it's unacceptable. It's dangerous. I know there's going to be an accident and I don't want my kids to be in an accident. That's it. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the petition will be dealt with according to the petition scheme. The committee will discuss the issue in agenda item nine. So thank you very much for presenting that. So we'll go move on to the community manager's report. Um, Richard Dean's here tonight, as always. Um, welcome. And if I could ask you to give your report, please, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair and uh, councillors. Uh, I need to chat first of all. When I was here in a different guise, I never ever got as easy a time as you just gave that sergeant there. So some tough questions next time, please. If you if you if you don't have any uh, tough questions, I'll just uh, I'll just give a couple to you, a couple of curriculars. So um, as we can notice, really, we can't start a meeting, can we, without talking about the the ever present um, COVID threat we've had. Um, we're here. Um, observing distancing and, and having a mask on. So just a little bit of information from our public health colleagues around, um, around vaccinations. So Hawks Road Clinic is still open for those that know uh, where it is, Pfizer vaccinations for 12-year-olds for first, second doses and 16-year-olds plus for walk-ins. And that's uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, 8.15 to 7.30. Um, and colleagues in Boots at Union Street are doing vac a, vac a Pfizer vaccine clinic for 16 pluses, first and second doses. Just walk-ins on Saturday the 12th of March, so that's 9 till 1. And the Moderna vaccine for 18 plus um, for boosters and, and walk-ins on Friday the 11th, 9 till 1, 2 till 5.15. And Saturday the 12th, 2 till 5.15. Um, I know it's a matter of personal choice, but we're, we're only going to beat this by getting vaccinated, I think, is the public health view. So if you don't know anybody that's vaccinated and they're on the edge, do your best to encourage them, is the message I would be giving. So all the rest of the information chaired to, tonight really comes from our Let's Talk portal uh, and the reference for, for people either watching online or in the audience, is if you look on the council website and do the Let's, portal, uh, the Let's Talk portal, you can find most of the information. Um, one... Uh, the main things at the moment is our yearly State of the Borough debate, uh, where we look forward to welcoming residents, businesses and community stakeholders um, to the event, which this year is online still. Uh, but this year's debate is um, going to take place on Tuesday the 22nd of March, and the theme is COVID impact and recovery. So please have a look at that portal uh, to register if you want to attend, albeit virtually, and indeed to ask a question. I understand there's uh, a number of spaces left for questioning. Uh, there's also another work, screen, work stream um, appeal there, if you like, which is a, a topic called Your Day, Your Say. And this is a survey aimed for people who live in the borough 16 years of age and uh, over um, who are looked after by our, our adult social care services. Um, so if you know of any people looked after by adult social care 16 or over or indeed carers helping them please direct them towards this particular consultation which will influence the way that this community are looked after going forward i suppose uh, the, the next one chair is probably dear to, to the heart of many people sitting up here in the horseshoe and that's just uh, a remember uh, to you that the local elections take place on the 5th of 5th of May, of course, this year, and you must register to vote in order to do so. And I've been asked by our elections office to um, direct everyone to uh, the government website, www.gov.uk forward slash register to vote. And apparently, if you've got your national insurance number to hand, you can, um, you can set up the uh, process so you can vote. All I will say, and it will be talked about later in this meeting, remember some ward boundaries uh, across the whole of the um, Kingston Borough have changed, so have a look at those. Your moment of fame now, Sue, put your hand in the air, please. This is a little bit of appeal here. We've got the Celebrating Chessington event taking part in the uh, Churchfields, 1st of June of this year, after a year's absence. And I'm sure most of you will know that this was originally set up to aid 
people from one of the more disadvantaged wards to have some fun and be educated whilst having fun uh, at a time when many other people went away during the school holidays. So one of the great things we have to have, and, the, and the, I suppose one of the great strengths of that Celebrating Chessington event have been, has been the local volunteers. Now, as we as a, as a council, I suppose, shrink in many ways, for me as the manager of the, the Rangers, hence that personal round of applause for me, obviously. Um, but for me, they, um, I, I can't really commit those Rangers to help in the way that I maybe could a couple of years ago. Um, so the plea tonight is to speak with Sue or to go on her website, um, sorry, email address, which is Sue, spelt the, the normal way, S-U-E, dot towner, T-O-W-N-E-R, at your listening ear.co.uk and volunteer your services for the day for setup or take down. You can also look, if, if you put um, Celebrating Chessington in your uh, search engine of preference, it'll come up with a Celebrating Chessington website and you can do a little email via that as well. So please, um, it's only with volunteers that these community events really work. So thank you. Um, right, the You'll be pleased to know I've almost finished. The Platinum Jubilee Street Parties. If you are thinking of having a street party um, over that extended bank holiday weekend, 2nd of June to 5th of June, you need to submit your application for your road to be closed or for us to look at closing your road by the 30th of April. Again, if you look on the council website, it's there. Um, and if you want to contact me afterwards, if you want to advertise it locally, there's a little bit of corporate branding, not from RBK, but from... Um, Buckingham Palace, a nice big place that goes with it. So, uh, And finally, Chair, if you'll allow me, there's, uh, we've been successful around our, our grant funding, I think, for the last uh, two meetings. I've explained what community projects we've done either by way of grant funding and ward funding. Um, and if any, anybody wants me to reiterate that, I can do so via email. I, I was hopeful, Chair, that I would bring another uh, neighbourhood SIL application to, to this meeting that uh, would go along the feedback we had from the... Um, from the online consultation and it's around developing pathways and green spaces in, in King George's field, which I, I believe members were keen on. Unfortunately, we've um, had a little, blip, a little blip in our process at this moment in time, which means I've just had to stand that item out, um, but I expect to bring it in, in the next couple of meetings. So, Chair, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's me. Thank you, Richard. Has anyone got any questions for Richard at all? Okay, all right, lovely, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, so we'll go on to item nine for this evening, uh, which is the Tol Tolworth Road Low Neighbourhood Node Traffic Scheme. Um, members of the committee and meeting participants may refer to Appendix A of the Agenda Pack. We have yeah. in attendance tonight the Council's Team Leader Strat Strategy and Commissioning in the Highways and Transport Group, Ian Price. Welcome, Ian. Um, I would first inform members of the committee that served to neighbourhood committee at its meeting on the 22nd of February 2022 is resolved to revoke the LTN on Tolworth Road. Um, so if I, I can quickly go through the, um, the, the recommendation is that the committee recommend to the South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee that they revoke the LTN on Tolworth Road because of the unacceptable impact on Thornhill Road and Surbiton neighbourhood and there being no possible mitigations possible in the short term. From two, if the South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee decides to, not to revoke the LTN on Tolworth Road, then the matter be taken to place committee for a decision. From three, a report on um, options for a low traffic neighbourhood in the whole area be brought back to the committee within six months. Um, so I will invite um, the, uh, to Ian Price uh, to introduce the report in Appendix A. Um, we'll then follow by public comments and questions before members of the committee commence in their discussion. So I'll pass over to Ian to introduce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to give you a short presentation tonight that will just touch on um, some of the facts and figures in terms of where we're at um, with the with the, the, the Tolworth Road scheme so far. Um, the report that, that has been included um, provides uh, an update on the impacts of the of the low traffic scheme. Um, and because we've got a particularly busy agenda tonight, I'm going to keep my, my presentation um, quite short and, and snappy so that we can um, spend as much time as, as needed um, listening to questions and, and 
taking taking sort of comments. So um, I shall move on to the first slide, if that's okay. So hopefully, um, yep, good. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, so the 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 first slide that you can see there is some feedback on the information that we're getting from the the Let's Talk portal. So this was the online um, engagement that was was set up to allow people uh, to share their feedback on it. Um, <clears throat> this is the the same data that was presented at the Surbiton Neighbourhood Committee, and that's based on 607 uh, responses that we had at the time of that meeting. Um, what you can see from from the data, um, if you can read those those numbers, and apologies if you can't, is that. It's roughly two thirds uh, of people are either very unhappy or unhappy at the uh, impacts of the measures that have been put in Tolworth Road. And it's roughly a third of people who are happy with the measures, uh, sorry, happy and very happy with measures that have been put in Tolworth Road. So, so that's, if you like, the, 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 the data from the first slide. Just as an update on that, the numbers since um, the Surbiton neighborhood committee have gone up from 607 to 645 and the, the percentages in terms of those for and, and those against um, hasn't changed in terms of the overall percentages um, so, so that's uh, that's as it stands um, so if we go to the next slide please so this slide um, gives you some some feedback in terms of the question was would you like to see the measures made permanent um, and those um, on the, the yellow are those who are saying no, and obviously the greens are those who are saying yes. Um, and you can see that the, 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 posi the position in terms of that is, is slightly stronger than it was for, for the people who are saying that they're unhappy with the impacts to date. So I won't dwell on, on that any further at this moment. If we go to the next slide. So this... Um, is just to, to give you some indication of, um, of of where we have been doing some traffic monitoring around the area. So we were um, aware that what we were looking at in Tolworth Road would have some displacement impacts. Um, and so we identified a number of sites, a number of locations across those roads where we thought there would be impacts so that we could carry out regular monitoring of the traffic data. Um, and these, the, the bar markings that you can see at the various sites are where we've been undertaking the, those traffic surveys. Um, so we've had data collection before the scheme started back in uh, October, November 2021. We've had some data collected um, at the end of January um, 2022. Um, and we just had a recent round of data that was, was collected as well in, in February 2022. Um, not shown on here, but what we've had um, carried out in addition to the, the, the if you like, the, the tube counters that you'll see on the road is we've had some, some video surveys done um, recently over the weekend, I think it was, which will allow us to actually interrogate some of the data in, in a little bit more uh, of, of a granular detail. So we'll be able to work out some of the turning manoeuvres and we'll be able to sort of see where people are going at some of the key junctions. Um, the video surveys will also give us um, some uh, an opportunity to actually sit and watch what the, 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 the traffic is doing. Uh, I mean, we've had many, many video surveys, that uh, not surveys, but many video clips that have been sent in from uh, the residents in, in Thornhill Road that already demonstrate this. Um, but this is, is just some, some additional data that we've collected that will show some of the, the, the issues I think particularly at the junctions, we're just keen to see what, what's happening there. So that's just a, a little bit of, of the, the data on that. Um, the next slide. Um, again, this um, may be slightly difficult to read. It might be easier to actually uh, look at in, in your committee packs. There, there's a table that represents this uh, in a slightly more, more user-friendly way. And, and this just shows on, on it, you, there, there are four figures on there which show um, the 24-hour counts in, in a particular direction from um, the before surveys. There's a peak count as well from an AM or PM that shows the maximum sort of like hourly flows that we're getting. Then we've got a 24-hour count for the January um, 2022 surveys. And again, a, a, a maximum flow from one of the PM or AM or PM peaks 
um, just to demonstrate what the sort of like the, the hourly flow is is on there. Um, so, so that's all, all all the traffic data that we we've got to date that we have been able to present. Uh, as I say, we have had some more data, but we haven't had a chance to add it to to the the slides yet, unfortunately. Um, but we will be looking at that, and we'll be able to to try and see whether the, the 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 displacement has stayed as it was in January, or whether it's changed or altered in in any way. Um, so, so that's the the useful feedback that we get from the traffic data. If we go to the next slide, please. So, as well as um, undertaking the um, the traffic data modelling. We've been using um, the, the traffic data that we've got to undertake some air quality modelling. Um, so we've brought on, on board the services of some external consultants. Um, and, and this is just showing the locations of um, the, the sites where, where the monitoring is, is being assessed. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this, um, this is a representation of what their their first iteration of of the modeling shows them at the various locations that you saw on on the previous slide which is in terms of how they think the modeling has um the air quality has changed as a result in the change of, of traffic so from the displacement and you can see that there's there's a range of of changes from um so the minus so the the fifth column across where it's got the change will tell you what the the, the sort of like the, the number of the changes from before to after uh, and then in the final column that's given their interpretation of the impacts and those impacts are based on um, national standards so that they're, they're not anything that, that we as officers uh, have drawn up there that's the, that's for the whole area Councillor McKinley so on the previous slide there was a, a set of of locators where you can you can reference that um, and what you can see from that I think we can see so uh, at line nine the receptor at line nine is showing that there's a, a reduction um, and the reduction is being classified as moderate and that is uh, in Tolworth Road and then I think further down at line 16 I believe um, it shows an, an increase of, of 3.6 um, which I think is one of the receptors in Thornhill Road, and, and they're classifying that as a slight increase. And as I say, that, that's not my terminology, that's the terminology that the, the external consultants have used in terms of how, how they present the data. Sorry, we, if you can, ask, can we leave the questions till the end? If we can do the presentation and then we'll ask the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so um, next steps, so following discussions with both of the neighbourhood uh, committee chairs, um, we've developed a number of options that might assist in mitigating uh, some of the traffic issues in the Thornhill Road area. However, as yet, as yet these have not been fully assessed, um, but on the next slide we'll, we'll have a list of, of what some of those topics are. Um, so there's some bullet... Yep, thank you. Um, so there's some bullet points there that just set out um, some of these options and some of these are, um, if you like, um, worst case scenario sort of suggestions. So uh, options to, to look at the closure of, of Fuller's Way north, south of Fuller's Avenue. Um, the idea that was uh, originally tabled uh, in terms of looking at a bus gate on Thornhill Road, but supported by other other measures such as one-way options on Cotterill Road and Douglas Road to, to prevent people just simply bypassing the, the bus gate by, by using those other, other roads. Um, consideration of no entry to Thornhill Road from Red Lion Road and no left turn into Fuller's Avenue from Fuller's Way North. Some timed restrictions, maybe AM and PM peaks, banning left turns into Fuller's Avenue and Thornhill Road. Uh, and a more recent addition was consideration of, of a school street in Fuller's Way North outside the school there. So, so there's some of the, the ideas that, that are currently on the table um, and that we'll be looking to, to review and assess. If we go to the next slide, please. So as a part of the, um, the original um, recommendations and resolutions from the committees, um, there was a willingness to set up some um, a monitoring group 
um, to look at um, the impacts of the schemes um, with the uh, local committee councillors, officers and, and residents. Um, what we are, are, are now suggesting because of the, the timing with the, the pre-election period, that we actually look to try and run some resident engagement groups with officers and road representatives um, so that we can continue uh, those informal discussions during the pre-election period when uh, local councillors wouldn't be able to take part in, in those discussions. Um, so that's a, a suggestion that has come forward. Um, and we've been told that, that we can we can do that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, a few bullet points of, of summary. So uh, measures, uh, the measure in Tolworth Road introduced nearly three months ago. Uh, responses show currently two thirds of respondents unhappy or very unhappy. Traffic displacement um, in the January 2022 count showed a uh, thousand plus increase uh, westbound in Thornhill Avenue across the 24 hour period and a 200 plus increase eastbound in Fuller's Avenue. Tolworth Road um, clearly with the closure in place shows uh, a reduction of uh, 1800 vehicles eastbound across the 24 hour period. Uh, the air quality modelling feedback that we've got to date indicates moderate improvements in Tolworth Road and slight negative impacts in Thornhill Road. So I'm going to pause my uh, presentation there, Chair, and happy to um, open up the, the, the conversation discussion um, back to the members. Thank you very much, Ian, for that. Um, so I'll now invite public comments on the issue in view of the importance of the issue to our residents and having regard to the high number of residents in attendance. I will be flexible to give sufficient time for everyone who wishes to speak. Um, um, however, I would like to ask participants not to repeat questions and or comments that may have already been asked and answered, answered or mentioned. Um, Herman will let you know when there is, um, when, if we're, we're sort of starting to um, look at the time, but uh, at present it's, we'll, we'll be okay. Um, again, no presentation by computer will be allowed. So the following persons I have registered in their interest to speak in the order of receipt of their intention. I've got um, Mr. Richard Bergman, if you'd like to come forward, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Right. I'm Richard Bergman. I live on the corner of Red Lion Road, Fool's Way North and Tolworth Road, where they put in the LTN, which is a bollard, and two planters to block traffic entering and leaving Tolworth Road. What the sheet up at the moment on there doesn't show are the overall figures. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of the impact that this has had, in very rough terms, the total westbound traffic flow was about 3,000 vehicles a day. That in the total traffic flow has been reduced to 2,000 vehicles a day. 1,000 cars have gone elsewhere, but all of those 2,000 vehicles are now running along Thornhill Road. Thornhill Road previously carried 1,000 vehicles, and if we take this as the base load, then the scheme has cut uh, the total traffic volume by a third, and the through traffic by a half, which makes it, as far as the neighbourhood is concerned, a success. The fact that it has doubled the traffic on Thornhill Road is something that needs to be addressed, but not by removing the LTN at the end of Tolworth Road. Having lived on the corner for several years, I can report that people's behaviour there used to be, uh, we'll call it entertaining, but there wasn't enough space for the vehicles that were using it. Um, people, used to, people ended up using sat-navs more and more and more, which meant that it became a cut-through that they previously wouldn't have used. 
There were fleets of quarry trucks trying to use the turn, all of which needed to back up in order to make it. I'll let other people talk about all of that. I have got several questions, and then one of my neighbours will also ask questions. Um, one, can our councillors please guarantee that the trial period will run the full six months as uh, promised and as required by the funding arrangements and previous council commitments? Uh, these, can these questions have been provided to council already. Um, two, how can you justify ending the trial early? Three, are our councillors are our council committed to reducing the volume of through traffic cutting through westbound through our neighbourhood, which is actually what this is all about? Um, and now, uh, some of these issues, I also have some issues with the way that the traffic was counted. Why was no traffic counter installed between the A3 and Tolworth Girls School, given that this would give a clear indication of traffic levels entering the area? This is the junction that we, uh, some people say, should be closed. But uh, this is the one that causes the problem. Basically, from my house, I can see the A3, the full length of Fuller's Road North, and then the junction to, with Tolworth Road. Before this scheme was introduced at seven o'clock in the morning, there were convoys of 14 cars at a time coming off the A3 and turning along Tolworth Road. The impact that this scheme has had is that the road is now quiet until peak time, and then you can watch the same cars going up to the school and back again, having dropped off children, and then it goes quiet again. So I think that the uh, the, the school traffic is a serious consideration here. Interestingly, on the data that's been provided to us, it says that the traffic counting tubes were cut at one of the locations. It doesn't say damaged, it says cut. And one of my neighbours actually had a look and they had been cut, right? So the traffic counters couldn't work properly. Now, between the particular, the, the impact of the cut traffic counter not recording vehicles crossing it and no traffic counters being installed where vehicles turn off the A3, is that it is impossible to assess the volume of traffic that comes and goes from Red Lion Industrial Estate. Red Lion Industrial Estate, I believe, is one of the main reasons why TFL won't shut the A3 junction. So that's an important consideration. Um, now, next question. Given that the uh, bollard appears to have been uh, it appears to have cut total westbound traffic by about uh, a third. Do our councillors agree that the scheme has been successful? And then uh, it is likely that this is, uh, uh, this is actually being covered. I, I actually had a question saying what further measures are council contemplating to reduce the impact on largely Thornhill Road. Um, also, I happen to work in Northfields. In Northfields, they've introduced a number of an extremely large number of bollards and planters in order to come up with a similar scheme. Their scheme has been designed to improve local streets by encouraging modal shift for local journeys. You can no longer use the car to go shopping in parts of Northfields. What measures are the council contemplating to achieve similar outcomes here? I have a feeling that a few timed left turn bans might have an impact on the school traffic. Um, the other question was about, actually about lockdown, the unofficial and then sort of official lockdown last year. Um, the initial traffic count ha happened to coincide with that, and that will have had an impact on the before figures and therefore make the changes in traffic volumes look greater than they actually were. And some sort of, some sort of consideration needs to be given to that. All right, those are the questions that I have. My neighbours also would like to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a few there that um, we won't be able to answer because obviously that's what the debate is yeah. tonight. Um, and so, um, you know, until we can um, have those conversations, listen to what to everybody, um, have a debate. Um, so some of those we won't be able to answer. But I think there may be a few there that um, I can pass over to, to Ian to respond to, to if that's possible. Thank you. Yeah, certainly, Chair. Um, so in terms of um, just talking about the, the position of some of the, of the counters, mm -hmm. um, so we, we did think quite carefully about where we positioned um, the, the first counter. And the, the, as you'll see from the, the map, there's one that's just north of the north exit, if you like, of Ronnelly and Road, um, which will pick up 
the, the through traffic. So I accept the, the point you're making that we're not picking up school traffic that comes off the A3 and then rejoins the A3. But because what we're we're trying to measure here is is the impacts of, of the through traffic in the area, um, that's less of a concern to us. What we're trying to see is the traffic that uses uh, Fursway North and used to use Tolworth Road and now uses uh, Thornhill Road. So, so that was the data that we wanted to capture. And that's why we've got the counter in, in the position that we had um, just north of the junction with, with Ronley and Road. Um, in terms of, of where the tubes are cut, um, what that will do is, is um, and they will, it will often be recorded as cut because the, the, the people that monitor the, the sites will regularly go out and look at the, the, the tubes that are in place to make sure they're functioning. And they'll report back to us whether they've been um, torn or cut, or, you know, it's just so that we've got an understanding of, of what the breaking data might mean. Um, but all the data that's collected up to that point is, is, is banked mm -hmm. and is logged, so we've got all that data up to the point of, of it being cut. And, and I can check how long it was out for, but they're normally repaired pretty swiftly. So, mm -hmm. so we will still have usable data either side of, 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 of the, the period that it was cut, if you like, where, where we, can, we can make use of that data so, and, and we can assess whether it's, it's valid uh, in terms of what it looks like on a representational basis um, against other days' data that we've got. Um, so so that's, um, that's those, those two issues. Um, um, Yeah, I think, I think they're probably the only points I can pick up at this time, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, next um, I've got on uh, my list is... Um, sorry, Thomas Wehem is would like to come forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Is it, is it on? Yes. Good evening, and thank you for uh, allowing my questions and points as well. And thank you, Mr. Price, for your report and your summary presentation. I've been a resident of Tolworth Road for about 10 years, and over the last few years, I've seen and experienced a significant increase in traffic and attending problems. Uh, my wife and I have three young kids, like perhaps many of the people behind me, who use the road and surrounding roads to walk and cycle to their schools, sports, and friends. Uh, we are increasingly worried about their and our safety, the health impacts of the traffic, the safety of our streets, and many of the residents on Tolworth Road feel similarly. And is there for our employer to consider the implications of any decisions you make tonight? And would like to ask you to consider some following points and questions I'd like to raise. And I'm glad I took some of these points down from looking forensically at some of the minutes and decisions that were taken previously at meetings from this and the Surbiton Neighborhood Committee um, that I don't think were fully reflected in the summary that Mr. Price gave tonight. So even though we know all about the budgetary pressures and cuts both at TFL level and the council, from the outset these traffic measures were described as low cost and quick win. What is the cost of a bus gate as described in January 2020 meetings and given there are budgets within the council for other schemes to help promote the health and well-being of local communities? Um, such as the Surbiton Neighbourhoods Committee decision on the 22nd of February to allocate £8,500 to supply hanging baskets. Will you discuss and investigate if and how budget can be allocated to fund mitigations and measures in the wider area? I think you will. Um, could you also update us if the application for funding from TFL with a decision due in early March, I believe, has been successful or has been published? In spring 2021, according to minutes, uh, or according to the agenda, there was a meeting held by members of this committee and that of the Surbiton Neighbourhood Committee. I couldn't find the minutes, so I don't know what was decided, what was discussed, and is there a possibility to have, have a sight of that? Because the decision at that meeting was not to pursue mitigation in Thornhill Road, especially as the cause result had led to the Serpentine Neighbourhood Committee to now petition us, our committee, to revoke the Torworth scheme prematurely, following, by lobby, followed, following lobbying by the Thornhill Road residents. I need to fully understand what was said there, because the Serpentine the Neighbourhood Committee 
was told about increasing traffic flows and still decided not to put in the mitigation. The, as I said, they have seem to have agreed to accept the displacement of traffic to Thornhill Road and other streets in their area, which they are, were responsible for, because after all, the Serbian Neighborhood Committee was responsible for looking at mitigations in their area. And even though some Thornhill Road residents fall within our, within our committee and unfortunately have to bear the brunt of the traffic, we have no say of what happens there. And the South of the Neighborhood Committee decided to go ahead with their scheme. For unclear reasons, the Serb the Neighborhood Committee has declined to consider mitigation in Thornhill Road. And that was all part of the initial plan presented in 2020. I believe Mr. Price was there as well. How can a fair assessment be made of traffic implications in the wider area and decisions being forced upon us, like a revocation of the scheme in Tolworth Road, without any uh, mitigation in the area to be considered by the Thornhill Road responsible committee, i.e. Serbit and Neighbourhood Committee. And I note indeed that a lady from uh, Thornhill Road has launched a petition. As per the report from Mr. Price, DFT's guidance, and I'm talking about real strict law and sad things, but under the Traffic Management Act of Parliament, which is the law of this country, the strict guidance is that um, there's, it's strict in its directive that schemes must be given time to bed in, be tested, and be in place long enough for it to be evaluated and understood. Um, I don't think two months is enough of a time to understand and evaluate. How can a local neighborhood committee, be it ours or theirs, decide to overrule statute without an apparent democratic process? And please note that as resident outside of the Serbian Neighborhood Committee's jurisdictions, first of all, many were unaware of the Serbian Neighborhood Committee. That may be our fault. But we have not been able to represent our case and we cannot appeal the decision they've made by a call-in, as I understand it. Throughout Mr. Price's uh, report, and I hold him to be an expert, it is apparent that it's too early to decide on the scheme with a strong recommendation from Mr. Price to continue the scheme. There are too many references and reasons this report highlights to mention here in particular, but if you leave through my notes, you will see. In addition, we have or should have heard some, now we have heard some further mitigations um, that, that are being considered. Furthermore, the chair of the Neighbourhood Committee, served the Neighbourhood Committee, has been quoted in uh, our local newspaper, The Good Life, and that's a recent one which was published about a week or so after the 22nd of March, that she is now saying we will look to see what mitigations we can do in the short and long term, where initially the reason for them revoking, asking us to revoke our uh, very effective scheme was because no... there are, be, are no possible mitigations possible in the short term. That all seems to contradict each, each, each other. Um, do you, the South of the Borough and Neighborhood Committee, to whom I'm grateful for having supported and introduced the LTS, think it's acceptable for Tolworth Road, or any residential road for that matter, to have to bear unacceptable levels of through traffic on a red run and um, will you continue to support the scheme is what my uh, neighbor already raised. Um, hopefully um, there will be positive and hol holistic results following a mitigation to be put into Thornhill Road. Uh, unfortunately, I thought I would stop there, but I have a few questions to uh, uh, follow on the uh, report by Mr. Price or the presentation by Mr. Price. Is that okay? Because there's some new data that came up. Um, I'm no expert at all, but the second bullet point there raises quite some eyebrows if you look at it in isolation. That two-thirds of responsibilities are unhappy or very unhappy is indeed not good. But what sort of analysis is being done on that? That could be people from China. That are, the happy people could be reporting from China, clicking on the website from China as well. Um, and to what extent is that feedback going to influence the decision made tonight? Um, 
I'm a bit worried that there was a, um, the, the video footage will show more granular data, and I'm not quite sure that video ad hoc footage of an in, in, uh, incident will give more granular feedback than data points taken over a prolonged period with multiple counts. And I also would have thought, and that's my uh, uh, lack of knowledge, that the data that has been provided will show exactly where the traffic flows are and that there's no further need for footage. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ian, would you like to come back on, on some of those questions? Thank you. Yep, certainly, Chair. Thank you. Um, so a, a few points just, just to pick up on. In, in terms of the uh, original schemes that we were looking at, yes, they, they were intended to be um, low cost and um, relatively simplistic in nature. Mm -hmm. However, the consideration of uh, measures such as a bus gate doesn't fit that bill quite. Uh, so for, for us to look at putting bus gates in, um, to make them effective, they would need to be enforced using AMPR cameras. Otherwise, they're, they're sort of like quite um, quite weak in terms of, of, of the enforcement of them. Um, so the, the cost of um, AMPR cameras in, in, in themselves is about 20 to 25,000 pounds. So it's a not a, a cheap measure by, by any means. And that's where we would have looked to have secured the, the TFL funding from. Uh, to help support those measures if uh, if there had been support for bringing them forwards. Um, so in terms of the TfL funding decision, um, we're still waiting to hear what our, our long-term funding uh, settlement is going to be. We have heard from the DFT, so the Department for Transport and, TF and TfL, that a short-term deal has been put in place until uh, until the summer. Um, whilst they continue their negotiations, which is, I think, um, <clears throat> a settlement of, of 50 million has been made across the whole of London, and that will be to to pay for um, ongoing active travel measures um, for TfL for the 33 boroughs, um, as as well as other um, other operating costs that TfL have got themselves. So, how much we see um, in in Kingston out of that pot of money um, is 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 not clear to us at this moment in time and we don't even know if there'll be uh, a process for us to, to actually bid for some of that money or not so so that's um disappointing that we're still in a position where we don't have any any clarity around that funding um <coughs> excuse me in terms of the um the data that we've got from the, the let's talk portal um I thought it was important just to give a, a, a very high level heads up in terms of where things sit, but you're absolutely right. What we will be doing is we'll be looking at that data um, in in quite fine detail. Um, and what we would usually do is that when we get to the end of the, the six month period that we call the, the consultation period, uh, for want of a better word, we will have gone through all of that data uh, in a lot more detail. We'll have analysed it on, on a road-by-road -road basis so that we can actually see um, where the, the comments are coming in from um, and who are making what comments um, and, and where the people are from within the, the area or without the area. Um, so we would look to have that level of, of, of detail that's supporting the, the final analysis of the, the overall um, sort of like um, responses that we get from the Let's Talk portal. Um, we don't use that data in isolation. Um, you know, there's there's other data. There's um, there's a, a traffic management order that's running at the same time that people uh, can comment on. We've got um, a street space inbox um, which which people have been emailing. Um, we've had emails that have come in from direct from residents as well. So you know, we need to pull together all of the information that that we receive from that. Um, and put it into sort of like a, a coherent set of uh, responses that consider all the points that have been raised. So it's it's not just the numbers, but it was just to give an early indication. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Ian. So the next person I've got on my list is um, Rory Dunn. If you'd like to come forward, thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, 
Good evening. Thank you for letting us all talk. Uh, a lot of my points have been covered, and I don't want to duplicate things. Most of what I want to speak to is more about the feeling on the road and the feeling about the process. We were all obviously overjoyed when we found out we were going to get a bollard at the end of the road and stop 2,000 cars a day screaming down our 30 mile an hour road with traffic humps that high, 20 feet from people's bedroom windows. There's a lady who's two doors away from me, can't come tonight. She stopped sleeping in the front bedroom because you'd be sitting there and just go boom in the middle of the night. We are so grateful for this low traffic scheme, but we only live 200 yards from Thornhill Road. They are not the enemy. We feel there's been a bit of inter-road rivalry going on. My major point, and I think the feelings of the people in the road is, you know, we live 200 yards from Thornhill Road. We want them to have better traffic and a better environment. We're slightly concerned, you know, we didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. We got given a lovely scheme. And now suddenly Serbson has just gone, well, you can't have the lovely scheme. And that was overnight. And we are extremely worried, especially since now they voted to scrap the scheme. And we're going to be taken over by them in May, but the boundary changes. And my very serious question from a lot of the residents is, does that mean that their decision in February, when we were not part of their area, to scrap our low traffic neighbourhood will automatically come into force the moment we become part of their neighbourhood? It's just a question you know, we, we're asking. Um, on a slightly trivial note, I would wonder as councillors, in terms of your communications from the public, what percentage fall into positive and what fall into negative? And if you're getting more than 50% positive letters from people going, you're doing a really good job and we really like what's happening, I'd be surprised. The fact that two thirds of the comments are negative is because people get incentivized to complain. We're a complaining culture, reason enough, it's a free country. Try and persuade people who've got what they want to communicate with local government going, we really love what we've got. No. You know, we've got a large part of our road here, but it's not the majority of the road. You know, a lot of people just don't engage with these issues, even though they have feelings about them. They do not communicate with local authority portals. So that's just... I'm not sure of the validity of the data in terms of complaints. I, I, do I have to go round all my family and friends saying, right, you've all got to send in emails because we can just skew the pitch. I just think it's slightly weird. Um, so just finally, the real worry we had was the speed with which the Serbson Committee made their decision. We thought it was a six-month trial. Again, we're not unreasonable. If the traffic experts, after the end of six months, say there's a better way of doing it, we'd love to keep the bollard. We love the bollard. There's no getting around it. We love it. <laughs> but if there's a factual, independent argument that says it should change to improve the traffic flow in the whole neighbourhood, we'd be reasonable. But we feel there's a sort of knee-jerk response happened. And so we've had to turn up in this sort of numbers and present these sorts of arguments in the hope that our South Borough Committee might think it'd be an unprecedented thing to do to vote against a scheme that the officers think should keep going and that the local residents think should keep going to benefit service and residents. So I would ask you, really, really consider not following Serbison's lead on this matter. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my understanding, just to say about the um, change of boundaries, um, is that um, if if this committee disagrees with the Surbiton committee, it would go to um, strategic committee of place um, to um, to make the next decision. So it wouldn't necessarily go back to Surbiton. Is that I think that's correct. Um, in but for the next. Did you part. see what but the jurisdiction? What I'm saying is the jurisdiction. If it doesn't go to the place committee by May, when we become part of Surbiton, what what happens then? Does does their decision still run? It goes to place committee. Right, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next uh, person I have is Sajid Saman. Would you like to come to here? Sajid. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I must admit that I didn't realise I was speaking after the first two people had all decided they were going to speak for the whole road. So uh, a little bit unprepared, but uh, I, think, I think most of the debate has been covered and it's quite a quite extensive debate and argument has been presented by both sides. Um, for me, uh, I think it just boils down to three main points. Uh, the first one is that uh, both sides are right. right? No, nobody wants these traffic levels in their area. And the fact of the matter is none of these roads are capable of accepting A3 traffic. The only scheme that would work would be to reopen the slip road on the Hook roundabout. So that needs to be back onto the agenda. And the second point I want to make is from all the roads that are not suitable for this A3 traffic, uh, Tolworth Road is the least suitable. It's one of the smallest areas, uh, roads in the area, uh, much narrower than some of the other roads in play. And the last point is the point that keeps re, uh, reoccurring is that we should wait for the full six months because by then we'll get a true picture of the traffic levels because only, it's only then that most drivers will have found other routes and it will get the long-term lasting traffic levels rather than the initial, uh, uh, initial uh, increase that we all expected. So all of this was expected and none of this is a surprise. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So the next speaker I have is Liz Mitchell, if you'd like to come down. And Alex, if you wanted to come down as well, absolutely. Alex Oates. So, sorry, um, if I can just ask, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sum, which road were you from? Thank you very much, thank you. Ready? Good evening, yes, thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, councillors, for your time tonight. With us today, we have residents of Thornhill Road, Olga McBride, Rob and Monica Heilinger, Yvonne Jones, Chris Benham, Andy and Carol Britton, Ben Handy, Liz to my right, and myself, Alex Oakes. We are here tonight to update councillors on the adverse impact that the Tolworth Road modal filter is having on Thornhill Road and the wider neighbourhood. This council implemented one measure of a seven-point plan in what was what was to be a low traffic neighbourhood. So one street, Tolworth Road, has benefited while Thornhill Road, Thornhill Avenue, Red Lion Road and Fuller's Road North, plus streets in the neighbouring ward, Douglas, Ellerton, Cotterill, Malvern, have all bore the brunt of this poor decision. What we at Thornhill Road are experiencing is a high traffic neighbourhood as defined by the TfL strategic neighbourhood analysis with over 200 vehicles per hour. Living in a high traffic neighbourhood has had an impact on the safety of pedestrians, school children, cyclists and road users. The residents of Thornhill Road want to see a holistic solution to the traffic problems in our neighbourhood. Tonight we are going to focus on several key impacts. The significant, in excess of 50% in many cases, increase in traffic along our road and others in the neighbourhood resulting in increased pollution and antisocial behaviour of drivers and our safety concerns for residents and those who use Thornhill Road. In regards to the traffic levels, 
our neighbours have been collating data on traffic flows and our data, data largely agrees with those the, of the council's traffic monitoring. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote some of those figures that have been provided by councillors about what the traffic numbers are in our neighbourhood. So overall traffic levels from the A3 to Thornhill Road have increased by 47%. There has been a 93% increase in traffic travelling along Thornhill Road in a westerly direction. There has been a 100% increase in LGV traffic. There has been a 46% and 22% increase in HGV traffic on Thornhill Road, western end, eastern end respectively. The figure on Hook Road shows an increase of 46% in HGV traffic and illustrates the point that more HGVs are using Thornhill Road to get onto Hook Road. Thornhill Road has, on average, as well as all that, on average, 180 buses travelling up and down the road every day. Prior to the LTN implementation, Thornhill, sorry, Tolworth Road residents had traffic of 2,419. Thornhill Road had 3,042. So that's all that I'm just quoting the figures provided by council. Now the same site in Thornhill Road is 4,230, an increase of 39% in a 24 hour period. These are your figures. So traffic on Thornhill Road was worse than Tolworth Road before the LTN even started. In terms of the neighbourhood, Thornhill Avenue has seen an over a 30% increase in traffic, showing traffic is coming from Thornhill Road and onto Tolworth Road to avoid congestion at Thornhill Road, Hook Road intersection. Traffic has increased by a third for northbound traffic on Fuller's Way North. That's traffic coming off the A3. There has been a significant increase in traffic travelling north along Red Lion Road, 75%. But the Thursday count is up by 160%. Fuller's Avenue have seen over 150% increase in traffic eastbound as drivers avoid Thornhill Road but then rejoin it at the western end. Traffic on Thornhill Road is one quarter of the traffic on Hook Road. And Hook Road is a secondary road with parking restrictions and free two-way flow. Traffic is not going to change. Behaviours aren't going to change. Why would people modify their behaviour when they only have to travel a further 280 metres down Red Line Road or only 160 metres if travelling from Hook Road to get to a viable alternative? It's not enough of a deterrent for people to change their behaviour. Their path is not blocked. They can still get from A to B with a minor, less than 300 metres, a max, diversion. It's simply not enough. And even the increase in traffic is not enough to change their behaviour. They're just getting angrier and angrier. And this morning, I was taking my kids across the road on their bikes and there's drivers yelling at each other, F off. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen. They were respectful for you, so please could we ask that uh, you show them the same respect. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lorraine. So I'm now going to focus on the safety issues that are being brought on Thornhill Road uh, due to the increased traffic that we're facing. So for those that don't know, Thornhill Road is a residential street with primarily families of young children living on it. The road is also crossed by... Can... Please, can we um, try and... I understand everyone's frustration, but please, they did show you the respect. Please show it back. Thank you. I'll, I'll start again, if that's all right. Thornhill Road is a residential street with primarily families of young children living on it. The road is also crossed by many children walking and cycling to and from local primary and high schools. The road is also used by pedestrians and school children getting to and from the K1 bus. 
As Liz said, on a weekday, there are on average 180 buses travelling down Thornhill Road per day. Therefore, Thornhill Road has more pedestrians and cyclists than other similar local streets. Thornhill Road is already a busy street that has just got busier. With more traffic, it is more dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists. Thornhill Road is a narrow road. There are infrequent areas along the road where traffic can pass. The increase in traffic volumes has meant an increase in static waiting traffic. Cars are waiting for space to travel down the road, and as there are more vehicles, there are wait they are waiting longer. The increase in traffic and amount of, sta amount of static traffic means that there is an increase in air pollution. We have also seen a substantial increase in road rage and antisocial behaviour, as drivers are spending more time queuing on Thornhill Road, tempers on the road are rising. The situation is particularly of concern when you have children and young people crossing the roads and impatient drivers. It's a recipe for disaster. Our street is not safe for pedestrians or cyclists. Several of our neighbours have reported that they have had their cars damaged five to eight times over a five-year period. Cars written off having been hit so hard they mounted the pavement have been reported to the police in the past. So going forward, stepping forward, moving forward, that's what we want. Councillors may be advocating to let Tolworth Road stay closed until other measures can be put in place. Our argument is as follows. One, these measures have not been agreed and there has been zero consultation despite our willingness. Number two, there have been no timeframes and timeframes are going to be naturally extended due to PERDA, elections, new committees forming, consultation periods, notice periods, waiting for funding from TFL, etc., etc., etc. And as you've heard from Mr Price, there is no guarantee of funding from TFL. They might have a pot, but we don't know how they're going to split it. We hear constantly on the news that TFL is broke and has no money, yet you want us to put up with the increased risk that someone is going to get hurt or worse on our road. With the best possible scenario in mind, the agreed measures could take six weeks to agree, so we're looking at the end of April. Elections, early May. Funding agreed, June. Consultation, end of June. Neighbourhood committee agrees, July. Notifications made, August. Measures implemented, September. So best scenario with all the will in the world and a good wind and everything else, we're looking at September for any mitigation actions to be implemented. Councillors are asking Thornhill Road residents to put up with the increased traffic for a further six to seven months on top of the three months we've already suffered with no guarantees of funding at all. In the meantime, the safety of residents and road users is compromised. When people start returning to work in greater numbers, traffic is only going to increase further, thus presenting more of a risk to residents, to school children, pedestrians, cyclings and all road users. I thought the aims of a low traffic neighbourhood were to make the streets safer. If there is a serious accident on Thornhill Road, who will accept responsibility? I think what we've all seen tonight is that all of the roads in this area are not suitable for the high levels of traffic that we're seeing. All roads in the neighbourhood are just not built for the high levels of traffic that we're, all of us are experiencing. So just to quickly uh, summarise our presentation. So this LTN has been in place for three months and during that time, council traffic counts show that traffic in the neighbourhood has not decreased, rather it has increased substantially. Air and noise pollution has not decreased and this certainly has not made the street safe for those travelling on foot, bicycle or by bus and traffic is certainly not greatly reduced. We are all concerned for the safety of people using our street. The residents of Thornhill Road want a holistic solution for the whole neighbourhood. If this experiment is allowed to continue, you are asking Thornhill Road residents and other residents in the neighbourhood to put up with this substantial increase in traffic on the roads and the resultant potential danger to road users, pedestrians, school children and cyclists. And you are asking us to do it for upwards of six to seven months in a best case scenario until other measures can be implemented and a further six months experiment of the new measures in total, over nine to 10 months of an increasingly dangerous and hazardous street for its users with no mitigations in place. And all, and all of this with no guarantees of time frame, scope bud and budget to do the measures. It just doesn't make sense. Councillors were negligent in proceeding with only one measure when it was acknowledged by highways officers and councillors themselves that traffic would increase on Thornhill Road as a result of the Tollworth filter. 
They did not look at mitigation measures on any other streets, nor did they really consider the impact elsewhere. In effect, councillors put the needs and safety of one street above Thornhill Road, Fuller's Way, Red Lion Road, Thornhill Avenue, Fuller's Way North and other streets in their own and neighbouring ward. Councillors have failed to represent their constituents equally, especially those like us on Thornhill Road that straddle a ward boundary. This is not Tolworth Road versus Thornhill Road. We are not the bad guys. This is about moving forward with an agreed plan like Surbiton Neighbourhood Committee agreed. Let's come back in six months with a solution that works for the whole neighbourhood. Let the whole neighbourhood share the short-term pain for the long-term gain. The Surbiton, Commit Surbiton Neighbourhood Committee resolved to revoke the Trollworth LTN as nothing can be done in the short term to mitigate the unacceptable impact of this LTN and there is a need to ease pressure on the area in the interest of safety. The committee also asked for highways officers to come back within six months of a holistic solution. We urge South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee to agree with this resolution. Thank you, both of you. Ian, did you want to come back on anything from that? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Herman, did we have any green slips at all handed in? Um, no. No, okay. If you'd like to come down and introduce yourself, and uh, sorry, we'll finish off on the. Um, sorry, I didn't have your. With all due respect to Mr. Mitchell and everybody, the impact on Thornhill Road. Sorry, sir. Could I just have your name and tell sorry. me which road? My name is David from? Tanner. I live in Tolworth Road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is this has come down to two roads against each other, uh, and whilst I respect and know f full well about the impact on Thornhill Road, all these things were discussed at earlier council meetings a couple of years ago and three years ago. And the reason that the LTM was put into place in Tolworth Road was for, um, and I'm incredibly sorry that they're suffering this now, but I've seen 20 years of it in Tolworth Road it's just a narrower street, and the reason it was put in there was because it was actually, we suffered all the same and more with Mexican standoffs, with idling engines, with everything else. And what the main reasons for putting it in were, and as has proved very effective, is that the number of foot, foot traffic and cyclists that are able to use Tolworth Road now completely freely. Not, everything has been said about the, the traffic, which you can, you can take the facts and figures and you can make them say what you want to say, basically. Not one bit of evidence here has actually put, addressed the fact that if you look at Tolworth Road now, you see an incredible increase in footfall, in cyclists, in children walking between Tolworth Girls School, Southborough School, coming, coming up and down the road, adults walking with their children, sometimes along the street, which I, 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 I know, I, I'm so sorry for Thornhill Road that they've, they've, in, they've got an increase in traffic. And I know all about what it's like to have to have Mexican standoffs and to have people screaming and shouting and idling engine and, and everything like that because we've lived it. Yeah, and we're, we're not denying that. And the, the, the total holistic and best approach to this is to find something that serves everybody. How we're going to get there, I don't know. But what won't serve any real purpose at all is just revoking this right now because if you actually put eyes on what's happening in the road and down Kent Road, uh, Kent Way, and you know, Thornhill, Th the Thornhill Avenue, I don't know where these facts and figures for Thornhill Avenue come from, because you know, the, the reason that Thornhill Avenue is used at, at all is, is, is mainly, for, again, for footfall. Yeah, this, it's, this is all about, 
with all apologies to the, the children, yeah, Tolworth Road is, is a highly residential area as well with lots of young children. You know, we don't want to turn this into a battle. We want to find a solution for the whole area, of course. But, but taking away the, the LTN at Tolworth Road will put, us, will put us immediately back into that situation. And all the families that have got used to walking down to Advantage Nursery, to Tolworth Girls' School, to Southborough School, along, around Cape Way, and where it is a natural cut-through between the schools, between the playing fields, down to, down to the sports centre at Tolworth Girls' School. Yeah. It's, it, 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 they, they will all then not be able to do that. And so we either have to walk along the A3, you know, which is, again, heavily polluted, or at least at the moment they've got a corridor. Now, you know, I, I know that this, these things will, will offend the people in, in Thornhill Road, but that we, these things were also all properly discussed when we first thought about this two and three years ago, and we had all the meetings at Hook. Yeah, you know, so... Yeah, I'd just like to ask the council to to reconsider, and you know, especially if you, if you are thinking of revoking the order right now in in order to put other things in place. Yeah, I don't know what else we can do to help mitigate the circumstances for Thornhill Road. I sincerely, you know, hope that something can be done with a, a with a bit more expedition than than is being looked at at the moment. And on that note, I just want to thank you and say good night. Thank you, Mr. Tanner. So I will pass over to um, members. Let me just um, get that to my notes. Thank you very much to everybody who's been a who's, who's taken the time to give us your views and your comments. Um, I'll now, now move from the chair the recommendations at the front of the report on page A1. Um, this doesn't um, sort of commit me to anything, but it's uh, just to move the item. Um, so the committee is asked to resolve that uh, the traffic data provided at, at Annex 2 and the initial feedback received since the measures were introduced on the 13th of December 2021 as set out in paragraph 13 be noted. Item two, the proposal for engaging with resident groups as part of the traffic monitoring arrangements is set out in paragraph 12 be approved. And three, a report back to the later meeting of the relevant neighbourhood committee to fully consider the impacts of the Tolworth Road closure, not before six months of operation. Do I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Archer. So if um, members who from the committee who wish to speak, if you'd like to raise your hand... Okay, so, lovely. Okay, so we've got almost everybody. So if I go to um, Councillor Young first, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much for everyone who spoke this evening. I think you'd really taken time and you made some clear and really well-considered points. So my experience is that I lived on Kent Way between 2003 and 2012, and I had three young children who went to St Matthew's School. So every morning we'd walk over Tolworth Road, over Thornhill Road, and up the hill to school. Um, and I know that Tolworth Road is a really narrow road. There are so many parked cars. The pavements aren't very wide. There's not much room between the front of houses and front gardens. Visibility is really poor on Tolworth Road. And it is really dangerous, um, absolutely. So, Liz, I, I sympathise with you and your children crossing Thornhill Road. Um, my experience was that Tolworth Road was a lot more dangerous. And just by its nature, I know that on Thornhill Road at the Red Lion Road end, it's quite narrow. But as you come up the road, it's a much more open and airy road. There's much better visibility. Um, that's, of course, why the buses go, go down there. Um, when I became councillor a few years ago, you rightly said that we've been discussing this for a few years now. Um, and I was really pleased because I thought, fantastic. We've got four schools near Tolworth and Thornhill. We're going to do something about it. Fantastic. And we spent a lot of time, as we all know, discussing bus gates, closing the slip road onto 
uh, Tolworth Girls School, uh, one-way systems, and then the low-traffic neighbourhood. And when I hear as councillors that we don't listen to all of our residents, we really do try to. And we did spend a lot of time discussing a number of the schemes. Um, and then one by one, sadly, the funding and the opportunities disappeared. So we were left with the LTN as an option. And when we looked at that, we thought, well, that is, that's a good option because it will be at least improving safety for some of our residents. And I do acknowledge that there's always a knock-on effect and traffic will find a way around other roads. But one of the things I think I'm most proud about as a councillor is um, introducing school streets. So I now live near Lovelace, where we've got a school street. Um, and I know that in the first two months of that scheme, of that school street being set up in Mansfield Road, residents really complained. They complained about the poor parking, the poor behaviour, the arguing. But once that settled down, I think everybody really realised that the, the whole point of it was that it would be more safe for our children. And I'm really pleased that we made that permanent. So I do hear the complaints and concerns, um, but we did agree that we would do this scheme for six months to really give it a try. And I'm minded to go with that. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McKinley. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Well, um, I've arrived late on this, just having joined the council in May. So I've done catch up and I've been down twice since we've had these agenda items to look at it. And I've listened carefully to very sensitive representations which have been made by people from both roads and other roads. It seems to me that the problem is us, the council, Royal Borough Kingston. And I really, I'm looking to colleagues here to give me some reassurance and hopefully others that there is a prospect of serious mitigation rather than it being used, albeit unintentionally, as sort of to buy more time to get us over this difficulty. I mean, if I... Can somebody list for me, again, the, the options of the mitigations? It's not obvious to me. The TFL has spoken, but it seems to me, from what I've talked to colleagues... Um, the prospects of getting appropriate substantial funding from TfL is not good. I mean, this is a question, not a statement, but I'd like to know. Um, things such as the gates for buses, is that likely? Is it, is it funded? Is it there? Or is it a pipe dream? Uh, is there any prospect of stopping the treacherous A3 Fuller's Way North Junction, that being curtailed, which has got a gravitational pull for all the traffic. Um, so through you, Chairperson, you know, I'm, I, I'm open to officers or colleagues here to persuade me and probably give some reassurance to people here tonight from at least one street that um, if we have the completion of the experiment, there really is the prospect or uh, one colleague here who spoke very effectively did do the uh, the scenario of the shortest time which took us up to september well i i, I was sympathetic to his case but i would be uh, if one really did see that we could marshal our rbk council machinery to bring this to a happy resolution in September, then it would be worthwhile. But I, I, I need a confidence building measure, measure from either the officers or colleagues here to tell us that that's a reasonable prospect, that the shopping list of mitigating measures, a substantial number of them could or would be implemented uh, and, um, and that TfL are on board. I mean, and the side chairperson, I'll finish this, since I've been on the council, 
I've seen gold more often than I've seen TfL officers. You know, uh, w w why don't we get them here? Or you get on a train and go up and kick some shins at the heads of the, you know, the TfL. Uh, we're far too passive, I think, on the council here in Kingston with TfL. But I'm looking for some reassurance that um, this is a reasonable prospect this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Ian, can you come back with anything? And I'm happy to sort of talk about the um, what I would like to see in the recommendations with regards to the, to the A3 junction, but I'll come back to you first. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm just asking um, Ian to come back. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the position we find ourselves in is, is that we submitted our bids to TfL back in November, as we do every year in terms of our capital programme for the for the following year. Um, so that bid has been submitted and, and been accepted by TfL. Um, <clears throat> it's with them. Um, we, along with every other London borough, are sat waiting to hear what the funding outcome will be. We, <clears throat> we, we have no knowledge as, as to what they're going to secure, how much money they're going to secure, or when they're going to secure it. <clears throat> And that's, that's the unfortunate reality of, of where we're at right now. There has been movement more, quite recently in terms of there being this um, allocation of £50 million, which sounds like a, a heck of a lot of money, and it is a heck of a lot of money, but when you spread, spread it across 33 boroughs, TfL take their, their, their share out of the, out of the pot, um, <clears throat> it, it might not stretch very far across the boroughs themselves. And we don't know what that that, 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 that money will be for. Um, there's been a suggestion that monies will be made available for active travel measures. Um, history has shown us that when monies became available from TfL previously, that they were interested in looking at live schemes and what they call in-flight schemes. Um, <clears throat> so because we've got a scheme on the ground, we can make our case that we would qualify for some of that money and we will be banging on their door to ask for some of that money should there be an opportunity to do so. Um, I, I think I, I probably can't say any more than that at this, this current moment in time, Councillor McKinley. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Councillor. Yeah, so I, I will cover that. So, so the, the, the bus gate option was one of the measures that, that we would look to bring forward. Um, and, you, you know, in, in the bullet points of the, the scheme options that we looked at, it isn't just looking at a bus gate in isolation, it's looking at some other mitigation on at, at the Thornhill Road junctions with Cotterill Douglas, um, so that, you know, we don't just send people along Thornhill up those other roads and, you know, to, to make further diversions in, into the, the other roads around, around the neighbourhood. We're looking to make the journeys such that people will stop using this area as a cut through. So, so that is one of the options that is, is on the table at the moment. Thank you, Ian. Um, one of the things I would like to see and um, to personally put forward um, is the conversation with TfL and to resolve the officers um, uh, meet with TfL to push the um, recommendation of closing the road or um, of the A3 to Fuller's Way North um, and um, to look at either closing it at peak times um, but I would like that put in if possible to to resolve that officers go away um, and have those conversations I know we've had um, I know I've been emailing them for years um, and unfortunately TfL were unable to attend this evening as our officer um, was subjected to COVID. Um, so she was unable to come along this evening. Um, but I think it's important that we, we actually push that forward as a potential recommendation um, to, uh, to try and have that looked at. Um, so yeah, that would be mine. If that's, yes, certainly Ian. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you know, we as officers have had 
initial discussions around that and almost got boo pooed a little bit in terms of here's some reasons why we, we wouldn't really want to consider it. Um, but it, it will obviously carry a lot more weight with with the, the resolution coming from the neighbourhood committee. Um, I would suggest, and then hopefully Matt's not watching, that we get the um, uh, the assistant director to actually write to somebody um, at, at the top of the tree in TfL, um, so that the matter gets escalated properly. You know, it's I, I can talk to my counterpart, but we're kind of down the down the pecking order, so it, it pays to escalate these things. I think. And we'll pass that to um, Mr. Hill. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, so if I um, yeah, Councillor Archer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to reiterate my thanks to everyone who's come tonight. And this is um, an issue that you all feel so passionately because you live it day to day. So I just really want to say thank you um, for all attending and having your voices heard tonight. Um, I just want to go to what my colleague was saying about kicking TFL shins, um, which is what I... Metaphorically. Yeah, metaphorically, of course. Um, it's something that me, as I do as portfolio holder regularly, in fact, I even emailed TFL um, today asking about the funding settlement, and she replied saying they're in meetings and we'll find out ASAP. We're in meetings now. Um, so I do hope that we hear in the next few weeks... Um, what part of that £50 million pie that we're going to get. I'd also say that at Place Committee on Thursday this week, we are prioritising our uh, LIP bid, um, and actually this is priority one scheme in the LIP bid. So this is a top priority for us. We completely understand that one modal filter is not providing a low-traffic neighbourhood and we want to move forward. We don't want to take a step back. We want to move forward with this to the next part of the scheme, which is mitigations for Thornhill Road residents. This is something that I feel incredibly passionately about and I'm committed to. And on Thursday night, a place we're showing that commitment um, um, pending the vote um, of saying this is priority one for us. So while I appreciate that Thornhill Road residents want mitigations tomorrow, Unfortunately, we can't have mitigations tomorrow. There does need to be a wait, um, but we are expediting this. And I, I do hope that, so the list that you can see in terms of possible mitigations, um, resident engagement, um, even with PERDA, we're wanting to make that happen so there's no more de unnecessary delay on this. Um, but yes, I really want um, tonight to keep the modal filter at Tolworth Road and to expedite this next part engaging with residents and then and looking at these mitigation measures and doing this as quickly as possible. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. I'd, firstly, I'd like to apologise to all the residents who contacted me, who emailed me, and I haven't responded. Um, that is because I've been moving house and I have had no access to Wi-Fi for several days. But I have carefully read all the uh, submissions. So I'm sorry if you emailed me and I didn't reply. This wasn't because I wasn't interested or wasn't reading it. I certainly was. And the two things really that have come over to me most clearly is firstly that everybody is right everybody's point of view is equally valid it's not a case of black and white it really isn't it's a very very difficult one secondly was the astonishing amount of traffic the numbers of cars that are on our roads thornhill and all the surrounding roads were built, I believe, in the 1920s when there was the occasional Ford Focus. Not Ford Focus, that was much later. <laughs> Ford Anglia <laughs> and so on, pottering up and down the road. Now we have families with two, three or more cars per family. And our roads, you cannot fit a quart into a pint pot. We have to reduce the number of cars on the roads or we have to find a completely different solution. And I don't know what that solution is. So I think that is really a significant point. I am wondering if there are any quick wins. And something that I did wonder, and I am not an expert, but Ian is, is would it be possible to prevent HGVs and LGVs travelling down Thornhill Road as an immediate um, 
well, as an immediate as possible response, because that would improve the air quality and would make it a little less unpleasant for the residents of Thornhill. Whichever way the vote goes tonight will be the right way for some people, the wrong way for others, and there isn't a right and a wrong. But I agree with my colleague Sharon here absolutely when we say that we listen very, very carefully to all our residents and we have to make our decisions in the light of the information we have at any given time. And it will be right for some people and not right for others, but that doesn't mean to say that we have already, that we are committed to one course of action or another, we want to listen to our residents first. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ian. Did you want to come back at all on that uh, question regarding the HGVs and LGVs? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, whether we're looking at LGVs, OGVs, HGVs, or, or just traffic measures, anything that, that we're looking to do is going to take time, unfortunately. There isn't something that we can do overnight that, that we're going to be able to put in on the ground without there being something to support it. So, you know, to, to, to prevent goods vehicles using uh, Thornhill Road would need some form of uh, traffic management order to support it, to allow us to enforce it. Otherwise, you know, like, like other measures, unless you've got the power to enforce it, to make it actually have some teeth, people are, are going to become aware and, and are going to ignore it. And we're not actually going to end, end up addressing uh, the issue. What we have um, talked about doing is uh, approaching the um, red line business um, business um, centre and actually speaking to, to them about whether the, that we can have conversations with them about the routes that them and their goods vehicles take, um, about the need for them to be good neighbours, about you know them sticking to to using the right roads to get their vehicles into and out of the estates um and wherever possible not using thornhill um because it's it's just not the right route um so so that's something that we're following up on um, and we'll be approaching them we're also looking at whether we can put in place maybe some uh some signage um that, that reinforces that um just in terms of telling goods vehicles when they come out of the industrial estate to, to access the A3, you know, um, to, to, to carry on their journeys. Um, so that's something we're looking at as well in the, in, in the very short term. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tyler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the residents who have come here. Um, and we received so many emails, not only from Tolworth Road, Thornhill Road as well, almost equal in number. Sorry, we, I didn't manage to respond to all of them, but we, I read all the uh, emails and um, all the concerns and comments were taken on board. Um, I agree with the previous speakers, my colleagues um, on points raised. Um, I know the area very well. Um, I lived in, in Kingston for a very long time. I go to gym regularly in the mornings um, on the Red Line Road. I see all the traffic. Um, I know a lot of people in Thornhill Road, Tolworth Road, and, and all the areas. So I know the issues. Um, with the Tolworth Road, um, the issue has been for a very long time. It's longer than um, us being councillors, Lorraine and myself. Uh, I think even the previous councillors, uh, the uh, complaints were raised about the issues, uh, the road rage, uh, accidents, near misses, and even I think during the lockdown there was a big accident. Um, so the issue has been there for a very long time. I know by having the LTN on Tolot Road, the issue has been displaced now to Thornhill Road, uh, which is not fair. So we need to have some kind of mitigating measures to Thornhill Road to reduce the traffic flow there. But it has taken us over 10 years to get to this point to have, to find the funding to have the LTN at Tolworth Road. Uh, by removing it, I think it's, it's, it's a backward step. I think we need to move forward, try and find uh, the, some of the mitigating measures which have been put for, forward today. Uh, whatever is uh, low cost, uh, it can be done uh, at short notice to come up with a solution to mitigate the traffic, not only Thornley Road, Red Line Road, and all the other roads. Um, 
I know even if he decides to remove the LTN, lo looking at the report, it will take, that will take time as well. I think we have to go through the TMO process, discuss with TFL. So I'm sure it will be probably another two, man, two months at least before we do anything about it. And then the pre-election period as well. So now that we have come this far, if we can f find a way of um, putting some measures, uh, low cost, um, these short term measures, which can be done within that period. Um, I know the resident uh, committee can be formed and uh, uh, that can be discussed during the pre-election period, come up with a solution. So I think overall, we need to look forward and try and find a solution for the whole area, not just Tolworth Road. Um, Tolworth Road, suffered or had the brunt of it for a very long time. And I know that the issue has been shifted to Thorny Road. So let's find a solution for the whole area. Um, and uh, so I asked, I know the, uh, the portfolio holder for place mentioned this is priority one. So we will look at it and make sure the, uh, the residents of the whole area get uh, some kind of measures the soonest. That's my, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Kirsch. Thank you, Chair. And uh, first of all, a huge thank you to all uh, coming tonight here, making the journey and uh, waiting and listening carefully to the whole debate. Uh, that's great. And also thank you for all those who have spoken and uh, made their point uh, quite uh, concise and deliberate and with compassion and uh, measurements, so very much thank you for that. And again, my apologies as well. I had also quite a lot of emails in the last couple of days and uh, I read them, but I hadn't had a chance to come back to you. Um, for me, there, there is no debate that this has a huge negative impact on Thornhill Road and residents on Thornhill Road. Um, so I am keen that we find a solution, that we find mitigation for making the scheme uh, successful for everyone. I think we heard a lot of good points today from, from all sides. And uh, the data that Thorn, uh, Tolbert, Tolbert's Road got 1,800 cars less than they had previously shows in itself that that measure is a success. And if you look um, at the, the, the high numbers uh, Thornwell Road had already uh, before the measure had been uh, taken in place, I mean, the success in Tolbert's Road shows, and there are, uh, also the previous data show, there, there was already, you could argue, a need for Thornhill Road as well. If he could manage that both roads get a reduction overall, uh, if the scheme is successful, then I think it would be a huge success across the board, and again, trying not to put it to other roads across. So pulling the scheme now, I think, would premature um, the portfolio holder uh, for environment and traffic and transport has already mentioned uh, it comes to place its slip scheme uh, priority number uh, number one for us, and um, we all know about what precious situation TFL is at the moment. But if we pull this now, uh, the situation with TFL is not getting better. If you're coming back in six months or a year or whatever, the things with TFL might not be settled. But then it's not priority number one for them any longer. And if we ask them for money, then uh, we, we are, we're not starting on, on equal footage. Now we have the initial funding. It's a life scheme, like uh, Ian Price said. It's number one on our lip scheme priority. So let's make it a success for everyone. Let's keep it going and looking actively for the mitigation, uh, mitigating issues. I fully support, and I hope we can add this to what um, Councillor Dunstan said, uh, that we um, ask officers to intensify the conversations with TFL. And uh, Ian Price already mentioned that we also looked at uh, our assistant director uh, is, is getting involved here as well. And I'm confident that he's more than happy to do so. I really like the idea and I would urge us that we put it into the notes, uh, Herman, for, for, for uh, any decision that uh, we uh, do the really short term, uh, hopefully help conversation with the Red uh, Lion estate and some signage which helps them, uh, their, uh, their people to drive along. I'm also still keen on looking how we could, what we could do on a 
TMO and how long that takes for uh, an AGB sort of restriction in the area, or at least for a couple of hours. So uh, I'm really keen that we get this going. And also in the paper already, which uh, is in front of us tonight, it says we want to uh, engage. We have already the consultation between the two neighborhood chairs uh, and officers in looking um, and monitoring the situation. And the paper already recommends that we involve residents from both streets into these uh, conversations. And I really uh, think that's the right way forward. And so uh, I really hope we can get this a success across the two neighborhoods. I know it will be all in suburb and neighborhood after May, but again, that does not hinder us to get this right for the two roads and the adjacent roads. And yeah, that's uh, what I would like to say. Thank you, Councillor. If I can just add, um, if we're looking at the residence group, I would like to have representatives from all those roads that are affected, not just Tolworth and Thornhill, um, and a mechanism about how we can actually get representatives um, put forward. I know we have got representatives here tonight of Thornhill Road and Tolworth Road, but I would also like to see um, other roads as well brought into that conversation if this, um, this goes through. Thank you very much. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your patience, because it's been a long evening so far, and I know it's difficult just listening. I want to say I went to both roads on Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning for Thornhill, and 10.30 in the morning on my way home um, for Tolworth Road. I'm not surprised there's a disparity between the two roads. Tolworth Road was like a ghost town at 10.30 in the morning. I'm not sure I saw another car move. So I felt very conspicuous being the only car moving. And yes, I did have a purpose to be in there. However, I really had terrific sympathy for the residents of Thornhill because it was predictable that it would be displaced onto Thornhill and yet most people would know that Thornhill was already heavily loaded with two-way bus traffic and therefore a lot of congestion on that road. I didn't see any HGVs at that time of day, but then at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, I wouldn't really expect to see it. But I'm not surprised because Red Lion Industrial Estate is there and those vehicles will be looking for an outlet. So hearing that the A3 exit might get closed. I'm going, hmm, where do these HGVs go from to get to the Red Line estate? And I can see a huge, huge problem. What I am hearing here tonight is that nobody wants to go back to nothing being done. Everybody wants something to be done. But everybody quite rightly wants it to be the right holistic approach. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened at this stage. Now, I noticed that um, the officers mentioned, I'm sorry, my phone keeps cutting out. I was going to read it very slickly. The original resolution from both Surbiton and South of the Borough neighborhoods want to form a monitoring group. We are nearly three months into the scheme. Has that monitoring group been formed? My understanding is not yet. And yet I think that that is a great loss because some of this talking could have been done prior to tonight and possibly prior to the Surbiton Committee. And I regret that that hasn't happened. I think the people who are most important in all this are the residents. And I share with Councillor Dunstan's view that all the roads need to be represented because we need to hear everybody very, very carefully. If we do one scheme that then makes it a problem for people in Douglas Road, then we're just knocking on the problem from one place to another. And so we've got to get it right. So as a matter of urgency, and I would hope not just waiting for the pre-planning, pre-election period, but immediately start forming that monitoring group with residents from all the areas to get together and to really try to find a good way forward. I haven't got any easy answers. I'm no technical expert when it comes to traffic. I do know that walking and cycling are important. It's great that Tolworth Road could accommodate that. Perhaps we could suggest 
that the children used Tolworth Road as opposed to um, Thornhill Road. But that's not the, that's a piecemeal answer. So what I want is a holistic approach and really to get it right for all the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Kirsch, did you want to come back in? Um, yes, just um, I would like also to, to, if you could add to the resolution tonight, I think it was the first resident uh, who asked the question uh, why our monitoring measures haven't included the um, uh, uh, road which comes off on the A3 and looking how it goes into the red line as, um, industrial estate, I would like to ask if we could put uh, additional um, uh, monitoring station in there to uh, get the data from that as well. Thank you, Ian. Is that okay? Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Goodship, did you want to come in? Did you say no? That's okay. And Councillor Thailand, you wanted to come back? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, I just wanted to make, make uh, two points, actually. Um, if we go back, decide to remove the LTN, as I said before, it will still take another two months to uh, remove it. But why we have come this far, so let's work and try and move forward. Um, and I'm sure if we abandon the uh, trial before six months, um, I'm not sure whether TFL will look favorably to fund this scheme in this area again, or uh, uh, but for the uh, officers to say. but. By going through with this trial, and uh, I'm sure we will be able to find funding from TFL to put other mitigating measures. Um, so uh, my preference is uh, to try and find a solution for Thorny Road and other roads as soon as, as, as possible. Um, some kind of uh, low-cost measure, at least a uh, short-term measure, and then a long-term measure with um, the consulting with all the residents of the surrounding roads. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so from my point of view, um, as uh, Councillor Thompson mentioned, everyone is right. Um, we never intended to um, look at this in isolation. Um, it was to look at the entire neighbourhood um, and I worry that if we remove the, um, the modal filter, um, the pain that everyone's gone through, both in Tolworth Road, Thornhill Road and surrounding roads, will then, um, it, it'll happen again. Um, we'll have to go through all of that again. Um, if TfL were to allow us to have any more funding for the area, and as Councillor Thailand mentioned, we've been campaigning for something to be done in Tolworth Road for a long, long time. Um, so I think to go backwards would be a mistake. Um, I think we need to make sure we're moving forward. Um, there's a couple of things that I would suggest that we would look at. Um, the signage, as well as Red Line Business Park, um, to look at um, putting signage on, to work with the TfL to get signage on the A3, um, at the junction with Fuller's Way North to let people know that um, Tolworth Road is closed, to try and push people to keep on going. Um, as I mentioned before with the A3 junction, looking at whether or not that could, something could be done there. Um, and um, speaking to Red Line Business Park is a start, but I think we really need to consider what we do with the, those HGVs and LGVs along there. Um, Again, intensify the conversation with TfL, as other colleagues have said, um, and um, increasing monitoring measures on, on Fuller's Way North. So they would be my suggestions that we take forward. But um, I had to say I've had sleepless nights on this subject would be an understatement um, because I've felt so conflicted um, for both roads um, and... That's when I know that we can't, we just, it can't just be about Tolworth Road. It can't just be about Thornhill Road. It needs to be about the entire area. So whilst I respect my colleagues in Surbiton and their decision, um, 
my personal feeling is, is that we move forward um, and we don't um, pull back, but we'll go to um, a vote unless anyone's got any other comments at all that they wish to make. Okay. Yep, Councillor... Oh, sorry. Oh, yep, sorry, Councillor Thompson. In that case, um, would it be possible to add to the um, recommendation, firstly, that the monitoring group is set up with immediate effect, ideally within yep. the next 10 days, i.e. by the end of next week, and secondly, that um, the conversation with Red Lion Road, with the industrial estate and the HGVs ha also happens with immediate effect, um, because because it's just so necessary and and we need to get this sorted as quickly as possible could that be added to the recommendations yes certainly um i think yeah that's absolutely fine uh, councillor stewart i had just sent you a similar message almost identical to what <laughs> councillor thompson was suggesting chair i didn't was reading it was <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually suggesting that the monitoring group be set up by a week on Friday. And I was going to suggest that, if possible, the first meeting take place by the 24th of March, which is just before the pre-election period, so that at least there could be some councillor input at the very first meeting, but then it would just be residents and officers after that. So that would be my recommendation. Um, Ian, would that be possible? If we put it in, it will be possible. It, it, it seems to me like it needs to be possible. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, so, uh, so if we'd like to go to a vote, um, so I can have all those in favour to um, move forward with those as we stated within those the resolution. Um, so, all those in favour, if you'd like to raise your hands, please. That's unanimous. Thank you very much, um, colleagues. Um, so that is agreed. Um, um, so we move forward. Thank you very much. So as residents, if you wanted to, to leave, I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to get yourself together. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, so the next item we have is planning policy on the Greenbelt. Um, 
We have the Council's Assistant Director for Strategic Planning and Infrastructure, Tim Naylor, to give a presentation to the committee regarding the current planning policy context, circumstances and parameters regarding the Green Belt. Um, Tim, welcome. Um, it's the first time we've actually met face to face. So, uh, we've done lots of online meetings, so, but welcome to um, South of the Borough neighbourhood. Um, so colleagues, if you wanted to move round to the side or to the front, please do. Um, and I'll pass over to Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dunstone. Okay, so um, I've got about 10 slides. This is a, a sort of fairly strategic run through um, the policy context at, at sort of national, regional, and, and then our own local <coughs> local plan level. Um, Fiona, could you move forward, please? So um, I'm going to cover uh, the, the the wider planning policy context, and then go into. I'll try not to go into too much planning speak, but essentially, it's the exceptional circumstances test, which would arguably be necessary in order to justify changes to Greenbelt boundaries <clears throat> and then put that into the context of, of our own emerging local plan and what that means. <clears throat> Next slide. So just a bit about what the Greenbelt is because, um, you know, it's a lot of things to a lot of people, but actually the policy background to it is that, you know, it is a formal designation, highly restricted, um, and it covers, you know, a designation for particular land areas. <clears throat> um, it's protected in, in plan making and decision making. So that's both planning policy side, local plan, but also the decision making that, uh, that, that enshrines um, development management. So at the sharp end of planning applications. Um, and the essential characteristics, and I'll go to the purposes on the next slide, but it's about reducing um, the threat of urban sprawl. It's about maintaining the openness of the green belt and the permanency of that as well in, in the context of um, development encroachment. <clears throat> and as I said, as I said, it's, you know, it's, pre it's preventing urban sprawl and keeping land permanently open. Next slide. So there are um, five specific purposes and it's interesting to note that it's not it's not a qualitative assessment, really. It's not about the, the quality of the area. It's actually what it does in a, in a planning context. So it, it checks unrestricted sprawl, prevents neighbouring towns from merging. Um, it safeguards the countryside from encroachment, importantly. Um, and then in certain circumstances, it can enhance special character of historic towns. Um, and the you know the, the 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 way that those towns have have developed over over time, and then also um, to assist in urban regeneration by encouraging the recycling of derelict land or other land in urban areas. So that's brownfield land. So focusing development on those recycling of sites that have already been developed in the past, rather than looking outside of that and, and identifying greenfield sites which could arguably be developed. Uh, next slide. So um, just in terms of the sort of policy hierarchy, so the government obviously attaches a huge amount of green belt, as does, you know, the vast majority of the population. Um, it is an important designation. Um, it dates from the, you know, the, the original um, construct of town planning back in the sort of 40s and 50s, really. So arguably, it's, it's a, it's a well-established um, designation i think that it probably needs to be reconsidered not not in terms of how it's um applied but just to contextualize it in 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 the 21st century um i think personally i think it's a very valuable designation but i think it's i think it's been misinterpreted um in terms of what it is and what it should do um, but I still think it's a very valuable um, designation. So the National Planning Policy Framework, um, on that bullet point three, it, it demands that Greenbelt boundaries should only be altered in these exceptional circumstances. Um, and that's about 
looking at, look at, looking at it through the lens of the plan making process. Um, which is the, the, you know, the whole policy framework around identifying sites that might be coming forward for development, identifying housing targets, what they are and where those housing targets can be met. And so the exceptional circumstances test is looked at through that lens. Um, and it does actually necessitate very uh, certain and specific circumstances in order to be able to justify development in the Greenbelt. Um, and that is about, you know, not being able to meet housing need in other areas, having exhausted your supply of brownfield sites and arguably um, looking further afield into the Greenbelt as being the last possible resort, essentially. Um, and the London plan similarly reflects the requirement for exceptional circumstances. And the mayor of London is very, uh, you know, very focused on all of the London boroughs. Um, having local plans which do not suggest encroachment into the green belt, there are one or two circumstances where that's happened, um, but essentially it's a very high bar both at national and <coughs> and London levels. Um, next slide. So going on to exceptional circumstances and what that means, um, we would have to demonstrate all authorities have to demonstrate that all reasonable um, options for meeting housing need have been exhausted before considering the green belt. So as I say, you know, that's looking at, at uh, intensification, optimization um, of, of sites that, that are presented elsewhere in the urban and suburban areas, um, looking at brownfield sites, underutilized land, um, looking at uh, how density can focus around existing centers and, and existing infrastructure as well. Um, and obviously we have to have discussions with our neighbouring authorities just to make sure that there's not an off chance that they might be able to also meet some of our housing need, which again, I think, to be honest, is a fairly unrealistic prospect. I don't think that we'd be in the position to be accepting um, adjacent boroughs' housing need any more than they would be uh, in accepting our own. I mean, I think all, particularly London boroughs, but all, all authorities, you know, struggle to meet housing need. Um, uh, and, and um, you know, identifying the supply of land in order to meet housing need. Um, so that broadly covers exceptional circumstances. And then I'll cover, I'll go on through a bit more detail about what that means for us in Kingston and the development of our local plan. So next slide. Um, so our local plan process, it requires us um, to designate our green belts and our, and our, our metropolitan open land boundaries uh, within the local plan. Um, they can be altered as part of that local plan review process, um, but it is ne necessary for us to maintain and, and designate um, those areas and, uh, and, and you know, have the Greenbelt policies surrounding that. Um, the planning inspectors can't force Greenbelt re releases onto local authorities. It is only local authorities that can suggest that they may want to relax the boundaries or review the boundaries. Um, but, uh, but they will only do that through the plan making process um, and that would only be in the circumstances where they can't find the sites necessary elsewhere to meet that housing need. Um, and if they were to encroach into the green belt without having demonstrated that they could meet that need elsewhere or have exhausted the, uh, the, the, the exploration of those alternatives, then <clears throat> the examination in public would find the plan un unsound anyway. Um, it's 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 it it it, do, it is essential essentially that that um, we we leave no stone unturned in terms of identifying the sites before looking at greenbelt, um, and then also the decision to adopt a local plan rests solely with the council, um, and that's the councillors. It is it is the council's local plan. It's it's the councillors' local plan, um, and obviously we would be putting forward a local plan that. Uh, that, that conforms to national, regional and local planning policy. Um, and at the moment, that would suggest that we won't be looking at the green belt. We can meet our housing need within the sites that we've identified through the urban and suburban area, um, which, which in, in figures is 9,640 homes over the 10-year period from 2019 to 2029. Um, and the recent work that we've done in terms of the site capacity of the sites that we've identified 
uh, can meet that figure. And the contingency around that is being able to demonstrate at the examination that those sites we have identified are what they call developable and deliverable, i.e. the sites will come forward within the time frame of the local plan. And we, and we have to have an evidence base which substantiates that those sites can come forward. We can't just arbitrarily say, oh, that site's you know, available and it will deliver X number of homes. We have to be able to demonstrate that there is a development proposition around it which can realistically deliver those homes within the lifetime of the plan. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so, the you know, covering the, 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 the process that we're going through at the moment, um, we have to be able to identify Greenbelt sites. Um, I won't go through that in detail. You can read, you can read that. We, we, we have um, looked at all of our Greenbelt sites, benchmarked them against the five purposes of the Greenbelt. We had a, 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 a quite a detailed um, report carried out at the, at the start of the local plan process in 2018. Um, and we went through all of those Greenbelt sites just to make sure that they, are, they do serve the purposes of the Greenbelt. And that provides our evidence base in order to substantiate that we, don't, we won't be looking at those or releasing or relaxing the boundaries of the Greenbelt um, in order to, to consider them for meeting housing need. Um, that will be part of the regulatory requirement or our examination in public to demonstrate that we have been through that comprehensive review of our existing green belt and made sure that it is still fit for purpose. Um, and again, that, that will be run through and, and explored at the examination in public when we get to that point in the local plan process. Um, uh, but, it, but it hasn't necessitated any alterations to the draft plan. So next slide. Uh, gets us on to um, the exceptional circumstances test, um, which I've sort of covered, um, and it is closely related to our, our housing land supply. Um, and as I've said previously, we don't think that we need to be demonstrating exceptional circumstances against the backdrop of the sites we've already identified. I should say, I, I suppose, for completeness, that the housing targets are a minimum and um, the way that the government seems to be directing the methodologies for calculating housing need would suggest that over time benchmarked against the, go the government's aspiration to deliver th eventually 300,000 new homes um, every year nationally by the mid-2020s, um, there's a suggestion, I think, an implication that those housing targets will go up over time. Um, so we can meet it at the moment, but we will be uh, required to demonstrate that we can continue to increase housing supply through the length of the, of the plan as that, as that progresses. But as I say, at the moment, we can meet our housing need. Um, and, and again, I've covered some of this. We, we have to assess the land is available um, to be delivered and part of the evidence space. <clears throat> and um, we, we will be carrying out the um, requirements in, in order to be able to justify that those sites can come forward. Um, and, and that will be identified and, and tested through the examination process on that final bu bullet point. Um, that, we, that we have been through that ex extensive process and we can demonstrate that the sites are deliverable. Um, moving on, Fiona, local plan evidence. Um, that, I've covered this already. This was, this was the assessment of the green belts that we carried out in 2018, that it fulfills its intended purpose um, and, and making recommendations that there aren't any exceptional circumstances exists. Um, so, as I say, I've, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but I've already covered that. Um, and the next slide. This is quite an important slide, which is obviously, you know, it's a bit confusing for people. So we are obligated to go out to the development community as part of our consultation process to canvas effectively landowners and developers to come to us to suggest to us the sites that we might like to consider through the local plan process that are available for development. Now, we have to go through that process. And as a part of that process, landowners and developers will present greenbelt sites that they'd like us to consider. 
And whilst those Greenbelt sites will get listed on our call for sites process and they will be published, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are there uh, as, as an expectation that they will be developed. So we have to analyse them, we have to justify and substantiate why uh, we won't be considering them. And as I've explained, that is because we don't feel that we need to review those sites at the moment because we can meet our housing need on the sites we've identified in urban and suburban areas, on brownfield sites that have already been developed. So um, most of the sites that come forward are recommended by developers and by landowners for residential-led developments. Um, and we do have to engage with them and discuss those sites and analyse them against the purposes of the Greenbelt. But as I've said, um, none of those sites will be put forward in the local plan as allocated sites for development. So they may be considered at some point in the future. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know where our housing targets are going to be going in the future. But certainly at the moment, for the purposes of the current green belt, they're not going to be considered. Um, and I think that moves us on. I'm sorry, there probably was a bit of planning speak in there, but um, we're, we're on for questions, if anyone does have any questions about uh, what I've just run through. Um, thank you, Tim, for that presentation. Um, that was really very helpful. What I'll do is I'll ask members and then I'll ask um, members of the public. So if I go to um, Councillor Thompson first, I've got you down, Mr. Robford, to, to come forward. And um, yep, I've got. That's Thank you fine. for that. You really helpful presentation. That was really, really uh, very uh, illuminating. At the moment, local authorities, as you say, are responsible for designating green belt and so on. Is it possible that the government, any government, could change the planning regulations so that developers would have a greater say in the de-designation or redesignation of green belt land. In other words, that, that, that developers could put also put forward reasons for um, changing the designation. Because they have been talking about planning reforms for a long time. <laughs> oh, there's a lot in that question. So they have been talking about planning reforms, but now that Michael Gove's taken over from Robert Jenrick, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sensing that there is a slight movement away from the... Uh, the nature and the extent of those planning reforms, certainly the zoning part of the of the original proposal seems to be becoming watered down. I think the um, <clears throat> I think the bit about design codes um, and and more emphasis on on you know the beauty of, of design and the and the local character will prevail, but I think the zoning is probably going to go in answer to the question about whether whether the government will relax the tests on Greenbelt to enable developers to start developing Greenbelt. I, I, it's, it's really difficult to second guess the government's decision making, but um, I don't think that's likely to happen because <clears throat> I think that at the moment, the, mo the main focus is on exhausting the supply of brownfield land and making sure that that, that can be used effectively to, to meet the housing, the, 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 um, the housing need. The, there was, as you will be aware, quite a backbench, um, a lot of backbench noise um, about the the planning reforms, and particularly from the from the shires, um, the uh, you know the nature of the implication that that would have on their on their you know cherished landscape and their and their their greenfield areas. So I don't see that happening anytime soon, um, and I think there will be. <laughs> probably you know a reasonable period where um, we will be increasing the density um, of our urban and suburban areas not necessarily the height 
but certainly increasing the density of that development. But again, the London plan's moved away from a density matrix and is focusing more on a design-led approach. So it's, it's a bit difficult to be absolutely accurate, but I don't think there's a huge risk that the government's suddenly going to relax hugely green belt designation or, or relax the exceptional circumstances test, which is, which is a really high bar. So, no, I don't, I don't think it's, it's likely at the moment. Thank you. Councillor McKinley. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr Naylor for his presentation. And uh, what he said and outlined is encouraging those of us who are particularly exercised in jealously protecting the green belt. I also noted what he spelt out to us and is not always understood. Green belt isn't about quality so much. It's about function of separating towns and, and, and giving lungs and so on. Which brings me to what might be for us members and our successors after the May election, is that people have got to start doing an audit of our countryside, which happens to be Green Belt. And um, uh, in fact, I, I, I wonder if that hasn't been done or is not being done to any great extent, I feel, uh, by RBK. There are financial constraints, but we ought to be, as a policy decision, looking to find funds to uh, do an audit of the countryside, which happens to be Greenbelt, both in terms of a defence policy to protect it but also to increase access to the countryside. We're the custodians of some very beautiful land. And indeed, I wonder if there might be some pockets which could be designated as areas of outstanding natural beauty. I don't know if that's a statutory term, but, but, you know, but we ought to be thinking about this, in, in my view. And I don't want to labour the point too much, but uh, as we are members here, of the council. I mean, we have been neglectful on one particular aspect, and that is jealously safeguarding our bridal ways and rights of way. And uh, I would hope that the next administration after this election would put aside monies, which would uh, ensure that land is examined, audited, understood. It, it, it would encompass, obviously, the uh, flora and fauna but access to the countryside, which, um, say, I think successive Royal Borough Kingston Council, councils have neglected over the decades, and we have a duty to stop that. And it would be a defence mechanism of the Green Belt, so I conclude here. If we, if we knew and were enhancing and working with landowners to increase access, public access to the countryside, coaxing and encouraging it. We'd be fit for fulfilling an environmental and a moral duty as we are custodians, not just of our green belt for Kingston, but for a wider piece of Greater London. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Tim, did you want to come in on any of that at all? I mean, you, I mean, you raise a good point about the, the you know, the it's a bit like doing a character appraisal of of rural areas um, we've got character appraisals for the for the you know the heritage areas we have conservation area appraisals and management plans so it's a fair point i mean from from purely from a planning policy perspective um, you know the studies that we carry out are technical studies in terms of whether that whether those areas meet the meet the purposes and how adequately they meet the purposes but it's certainly something that um and, and you're right about you know custodians of the of the of the land for future generations, um, but it's certainly something that we could we could probably go away and think about um, uh, as to whether that's something that could use to be used as an evidence base to support the local plan. Apologise to you, the chairperson and colleagues, but the other thing which I wanted to take this opportunity of canvassing is the fact that the next administration after the council elections, I hope that they will consider setting up a joint liaison committee with our neighbours Epsom and Yule, Mole Valley and Elmbridge 
uh, because we, both in respect of the green belt and the countryside, but also as an aside, we share the A243 spine and highways relating it. And we really ought to have both a member and an officer machinery, which does meet to bear in mind that the borough boundaries straddle um, uh, green belt areas in particular countryside. And as I say, there are highway, highway issues which are of common interest. And uh, it's not rocket science. We ought to at very least explore this with our three neighbors Stroke Surrey County Council as well, the fourth. And um, perhaps there might be, if you look to the east and west of what we represent here, south of the borough, we, we've got um, uh, the uh, Crown Estates Commissioner's land to our west, and we've got the uh, Ashty Common, which is owned and controlled and has some resources, uh, owned by the Corporation of London. And it I, I'm just disappointed. I have informally talked to colleagues about this over cups of tea. Uh, probably I should have banged on and put a formal resolution to the council or something or other. But can we think about it? Can we leave a note to our successors after the May elections that they do explore this with some seriousness? Because it would pay enormous dividends if we were working in conjunction with our neighbours, Epsom and York, Mole Valley, Elmbridge, Surrey County Council, and those two other agencies, Crown Estates Commissioners and Corporation of London. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll if, take that back for noting to have to look after, look forward to um, to putting something together. That would be good. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cash. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks, uh, Tim, for, for the presentation today and to uh, try to explain a very complicated um, uh, situation and uh, where and I think I also found it really uh, helpful and enlightened that you made the clear distinction that we get sites brought forward uh, on on the green belt, which we as a local authority office have to access, but which does not mean that we have to exclude the, uh, include them in our local plan. And uh, from from the analysis you have given, that we can meet our housing targets without touching the green belt, that gives me the comfort and the pleasure to say that this administration with the emerging local plan we are working on, uh, we are not touching on the green belt, there is no need, and I just wanted to give that reassurance. Thank you, Councillor Kirsty. Do you want to come back on that? Any, any part of that? No, only, only to say that, yes, that's, that, that is the current situation, but I don't have a crystal ball and housing targets are a minimum and, you know, the, the likelihood is they're going to go north. So, Thank you. Um, so I'll come back to Mr. Rob. Did you want to come down? Is it on? Yeah? No. Yes? yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Lorraine Dunstan, first of all, because um, she's um, been uh, excellent and she's listened and brought this um, item to the agenda tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank Tim for coming as well. Um, can I ask, first of all, this um, list of exceptional circumstances that developers are giving you, is that a public list? Can we go on out there and see which ones? Are, uh, we do know of, like, Poppy Mill have, have said that they've, they've got ways around the, um, this, this law. Yes, it is. Our call for sites. Well, our call for sites list is public. Um, <clears throat> we, when we did the further engagement for the local plan, this last sorry last summer, um, from June to October, we did another call for sites so that we could refresh. And we, we, did, we didn't. It, it, it didn't. It didn't um, preclude the previous call for sites. We, we just wanted to make sure that the previous call for sites was still valid and the people that had provided the information for that were still in, intending to put those sites forward. And it didn't throw up any new sites, but it, but it does contain the Greenbelt sites. So yes, I can I can find that information. It's on the internet somewhere. I'll find it for you. Thank you very much. Um, and I can signpost it for you. Back on again, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so on the 2018 map, uh, we've got um, the most contentious area, obviously, is the uh, Chesham Equestrian Centre, which is, uh, I think, Greenbelt's um, areas 15, 16, and 17, something like that. Um, I went down Clayton Road today, and uh, I was uh, coming towards me were, uh, horrifically, um, these 30-ton lorries again going into the site. These, um, you know, it reminded me of the 300,000 tonnes of uh, London waste that were dumped on the site to uh, supposedly level them out. Um, we need that site checked, what's going on there, because I looked across and it actually looks worse than it's ever been. It's, it's not improved. It, it, no, it, I mean, there seems to be more on that site than ever. So um, you, you talked about on, in your speak about uh, it's got to be protected. But how are we actually protecting it? And uh, when we find there's a problem, like maybe um, uh, 140 or 50 enforcement uh, orders, what are we doing about them? Yeah, that, that site, um, as you know, I've, um, we inherited a lot of the existing unlawful uses when the boundary changes came across from Elmbridge. Um, so that, that you know, there was, there was a historic inheritance of that, but it has been manifesting for two decades. Um, we are currently uh, doing a more detailed um, cross-service, you know, across across the council services, but also across some of the wider agencies piece of work, which is trying to disaggregate and pull it, you know, and pull an action plan together. Um, there are scaffold companies representing unlawful uses. You've got um, residents occupying the site, which are unlawful uses, both foreign nationals, also um, gypsy and, and Romani travellers. Um, and then some, you know, arguably legitimate uses. There's a lot of equestrian. I, I was actually on site this afternoon. I went there myself and had a look around this afternoon, which was quite enlightening. Did you, did you see the lorries? I, I saw lots of things, yeah, lorries, um, yeah, a lot of movement, actually. I was surprised at, at, at quite how much traffic was going in and out. Um, but so, so we, are, uh, we, are, we, we are developing a, a greater analysis and developing an action plan. But the, the degree of, well, the length of time, the cost and the degree of success in terms of Existing established uses, um, you know, whether whether those are going to be challenged in the courts, um, whether whether we've got you know sufficient um, um, justification to do what we're doing, you know, all of those things will be explored. And I am at the pro in the process uh, it, within the planning service in bringing in new resources so that we can we can have a dedicated enforcement team looking oh, at excellent. that area. But there are a number of additional considerations, such as you know the well-being and the welfare of the residents on site as well. So we need to consider you know those 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 welfare issues as well in the same process. Uh, that's excellent. I mean, one of the things that uh, I went to the um, Poppy Mill um, uh, exercise, and um, they kept telling me it's going to cost eight million pounds to clear the site up. But my argument is that um, uh, if they bought the site, knowing that, I mean, that's not a defence. You know, I mean, they can't say we, we, it's better we build on it uh, than spend eight million pounds clearing it up because they actually—it's uh, not as though it's, um, it's a surprise. They actually built it in the knowledge uh, that it's going to take money to clear it up, but. If I can ask another scenario, we're not totally against um, sort of building that sort of thing, but where we got um, Chesington Golf Club, we've had the golf club, um, <laughs> the club itself, burnt down several times, etc. And so you've got an area of land there with a car park and everything else, which um, is not really greenbelt. But what we do need uh, for the whole of the RBK, not just um, individual ones, we need a new leisure centre for RBK. Um, is there any way that that land there could be used for a, a Royal Borough of Kingston uh, proper, not just a small um, um, thing, um, item, but a real proper leisure centre? So first of all, can I just um, bring um, Councillor Thompson in because I think she wanted to come in and then we'll come back and I know Councillor Kirsch wants to come in as well. So if I go to Councillor Thompson, then I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Um I just wanted to say that uh, in light of what Mr. Naylor has just said, that actually I've been trying to find, I've been working on the, um, 
on the on the Clayton Road, the five acre site, the five acre farm site, for years and years. And in fact, I've just found some letters to me about it, about the enforcement actions dated 1998, and we're now in. 2022 so it's not as if we've not been doing anything and in all that time um, I actually think we are doing more and being more effective and actually addressing the issues and trying to trying to um, disaggregate them and and understand that it's very complex it's not simplistic at all it's a very complex and nuanced problem and I think we're doing more now than I have ever seen in 24 years. So I just want to thank Mr. Naylor and his colleagues for that because um, this is really important and we are making more progress and doing more than ever before. And I think that is um, excellent. As far as I just put my two penneth in about the, um, the golf course site, actually been down this road a couple of times and there have been so many complications and objections in the way that that is why nothing has happened there. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just come back on that? Because obviously, it's, it's obviously my yes, debate. Come back on. Yeah. Come back on the. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. I, I, I talk about yeah. the. Um, but um, but why, why then? If you're saying you've done better than ever before, I mean, it's been going on so long. I can't believe that. Um, we've allowed uh, or licensed extra scaffolding lorry, lorries. I know it's not the, the, the question site, but it's the site next door. We actually allowed even more scaffolding lorries to go on the site. Didn't so, no, Mr. We Rob? Didn't. We did Mr. not allow it. Sorry. I, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I completely... We did not allow it. We opposed it on... From a planning part, point of view, we, we opposed it from, a, from ward councillors, myself. We have all... But it's not something that we have control over. Yeah. And I can assure you um, that we have, and I've said to you before, we have opposed every single application that has come forward. Unfortunately, it's out of our control, but we have opposed so it. So who, who allowed it? The, um, what, I can't remember yet, Tim. It's, it's the, uh, the traffic commissioner um, who is responsible for uh, issuing licenses for HGV applications. As Councillor Dunstone says, we, we have objected formally, letter from me, um, to the Traffic Commissioner on every one of these uh, HTV licences and, and we have now in the process of issuing a formal complaint to the Traffic Commissioner for issuing these licences and we've made the case that how can he be issuing uh, HTV licences for businesses which are operating unlawfully on a site, yeah. you know, and it's just a different, you know, it's a different piece of legislation essentially and it's not something that, you know, our evidence is not something that, that he considers or he or she considers. Yeah. In, that, in that case, I'd like to apologise. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Last letter to them, they replied to me basically telling me to stop writing these letters because in their view it was no more than a neighbour dispute and that none of our um, and that none of my concerns and I was writing both as a local resident adjoining the site and as a local councillor um, that none of the that none of my objections held water and it was no more than a um, than an, he, he they actually described it as a neighbour dispute. Just quickly, and can we just an update from Ian? Is are the traffic um, restrictions being put in place? We are coming up to that oh, okay, the next okay. part of the agenda. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Councillor Kirsch, who wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on the uh, golf course, I really just wanted, again, to reiterate this is green belt. I know there have been fancy plans uh, previously. We always oppose them. Residents oppose these fancy plans. Residents are spooked. They cherish the green belt there. Uh, what we decided on la uh, two weeks ago uh, on the uh, Corporate and Resources Committee is uh, to look seriously at providing a pool in south of the borough at the Chessington site next year, uh, next door to us, uh, pending a feasibility study. If the feasibility study is positive, we will bring this forward to a proper business case and then develop a pool uh, here if everything stacks up. So uh, this is a feasible site, not touching on Greenbelt, not building a, a huge leisure centre, which uh, uh, is not to be afforded in the first place after what else uh, we are doing, and also which is not putting additional massive traffic if you would build a fancy great leisure centre at that site, having it next to uh, Chessington World of Adventures, where residents already complain about traffic, I don't think it would be the right location for Chessington residents to have a massive co call to uh, leisure centre at this site, despite all the other things I mentioned. So we are building a pool for south of the borough, a feasibility stacks up, and uh, yeah, this site is, I think, not appropriate. Sorry.
It's just a quick comment. You're, you're building a pool in the same place, so I can't see that's an argument. But anyway, I won't go into that one. But um, but anyway, thanks for that. Um, and then I say thanks for coming because it's it's a real sort of a worry because we probably hold the most of the green belt for RBK in this, you know, and uh, we are sort of, um, you know, we want to protect it really. But thanks very much. I do appreciate it. And thank you to all your team because I do pester them quite a lot and uh, they always reply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rob. No one else... There's no one else has got any questions. Thank you very much, Tim, for coming along this evening. As I say, nice to meet you. Um, and uh, you're free to, to leave if you wish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And yes, it is. It's, it's, uh, it's very refreshing and nice to see people face to face for once. So yeah, after two years of looking through a screen. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. OK, so we'll go to item 11, Clayton Road weight restriction, a TMO objections. Um, we'll move on to agenda item 11 on the Clayton Road. Um, members of the committee and meeting participants may refer to Appendix B of the agenda pack. Um, the Council Strategy and Commission Team Leader in the Highways and Transport Group, Ian Price. Um, if I can ask you to introduce the report, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair. I will keep my introduction um, short and snappy, just mindful of, of the late hour that we're at already. So the report at Appendix B covers objections received during the statutory post process for King Map P318, which relates to the proposed weight restrictions for Glayton Road. <clears throat> the current road layer at the, um, at the width restriction at the west end uh, of Clayton Road um, has not been effective in preventing large vehicles from driving through it. Um, we've had traffic counts um, that were taken in various locations along the road, which identified that um, we've got higher than expected levels of HGVs um, and LGVs on, on the sections of Clayton Road where we've measured it. <clears throat> and I would just add that the, the layout that was put in place many years ago had within it a mechanism to allow uh, the fire brigade to, to actually make their way through it without taking out bollards to, to sort of like to, to, to head to any sites that they needed to attend um, on, on call at, at the shortest possible time without affecting their, their call out times. However, once um, larger vehicles became aware that, that the fire tenders could get through the, the width restriction, then obviously so could they. Um, this sort um, this brought forward a, a, an increase in the number of H HGVs, LGVs that were, that were using this part of the road, and that resulted in quite substantial damage to the footways, uh, the kerbs where there was vehicle overrun, um, obviously putting a, a burden on, on the council purse. Um, the increase in act activity um, led to us looking into options here. And as uh, Tim Nader was saying earlier, this was something that was discussed as a part of the, the Hook Liaison Partnership Group um, that was considering a, a raft of issues across the area. It's intended that the measures that were included in, in the TMO measures um, are simply looking to replace the physical width restriction um, with a different type of restriction, so a weight restriction, which will have the same impact in terms of the traffic that should be using the road network. Um, the differential being that we would look to enforce it using AMPR cameras um, <clears throat> so that we could create a, an exemption list that would allow fire brigade vehicles, emergency service vehicles to, to, to use the road without having to make any, any other manoeuvres and they could just travel um, in, in a straight line as they went through it. Uh, the, the proposals put forward um, uh, intend to achieve the same outcomes as, as the current width restriction, so it's not a case of changing what traffic should be used in the highway network, it's a case of just changing how we enforce it. The comments um, and observations from people who commented during the statutory process can be found at paragraphs 13 to 15 <coughs> in the report. Um, those people who chose to object um, are set out in the report at paragraph 16 and 17. And it's noted that two of the objections that we received were from uh, neighbouring authorities. So we had uh, a Surrey County councillor, 
sorry, County Council councillor uh, who, who objected, and there was also the Claygate Parish Council who, who raised objections about the potential for this to increase traffic through the, the Claygate area as a result of what we were doing. Um, we, in the report, have set out that what we're intending to do is, is just to keep the restrictions uh, as they should be. So, so we're not looking to change um, traffic patterns on the road. We're just wanting traffic to be using the parts of the road network that it should that it should be. So we're, we're not looking to increase traffic uh, m movements on the road. Um, I would just add as well that during the TMO process, we engaged with Surrey, with my, our counterparts at Surrey County Council, um, and we'll continue to do so. Um, they uh, understood if you like, our, our intention of why we were doing it. They were keen to see the traffic data that we had um, captured when we'd done our surveys so they could understand the, the patterns of, of where the traffic should be on the network and what that would mean, if anything, for the neighbouring areas around Claygate. Um, and so the, based on, on those assessments, we felt comfortable setting, recommending that we set the objection as a side chair and there as per set out in the report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ian. Um, so it's no, so um, I don't know, I'll move to, I'll move to the debate. Um, so is there anybody that's got any comments or questions at all? No? Nope. Yep. Margaret. Thank you. Again, speaking as local councillor and... Um, from a local resident's perspective, this is the best offer we've had, basically. And although it may not be perfect, and I know some people have raised the objections, as in the um, uh, as given in the report, the comments I have had personally from local residents have been almost overwhelmingly in favour on the grounds that whatever we do has got to be better than what we've got now. And this scheme will answer a lot of the problems that have been identified. It, of course, may need tweaking, but then may need, any scheme might anyway. And I think that we should um, ha be happy to adopt this in the understanding that it is going to improve the situation for our local residents because it is so difficult at the moment. It is just so difficult at the moment. Um, and as Ian says, as regards the Claygate and Surrey councillors' objections, if the width restriction was doing its job, then, 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 then their fears would have happened years and years and years ago. The, 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 the restriction just needs to be doing its job, basically. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions at all or comments? OK, well, in that case, um, I will now move this from the chair. Uh, the recommendations at the front of the report on page B1. Um, the committee is asked to resolve that the responses received during the statutory traffic management order process for Clayton Road be noted. Two, the decision with Surrey County Council set out in paragraphs 10 and 11 of the report be noted. Three, the objections of, to the TMO is set out in paragraph 16 to 18 of the report be set aside for the reasons stated in paragraphs 19 to 26. And finally, the TMO will be made and the objectors notified of the decision in line with the statutory process allowing the scheme to be implemented. Do I have a seconder, please? Yeah, Councillor Archer, thank you very much. Um, so um, if we go to the vote, can I ask all those in favour to raise their hands? So that's unanimous. Thank you very much, colleagues. So we'll go find to the next item, Clayton Road footway and parking arrangements. Um, as we move on to this agenda item, um, and members of the committee and meeting participants may refer to Appendix C of the agenda pack. The councillors, so I I'll, I'll, won't give out the full title again because he's, he's had it a couple of times tonight already. Um, so I'll pass it over to Ian to introduce the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'll keep my introduction um, short and succinct. Um, so the report at Appendix C um, highlights issues um, that were raised in parts of Clayton Road um, with the current footway parking arrangements and also identified some other minor, park, some other minor amendments that were required. We undertook a review of the on-street arrangements. 
um, along Clayton Road. Um, and for the committee's information, um, this can be seen at, um, uh, at Annex 1, where we've, we've indicated um, what, um, what proposals and what measures we, we have been brought, bringing forward. Um, some of the works that we identified as part of our um, on-street review were what we considered to be uh, some business-as-usual pieces of works. Um, so there were some adjustments to some disabled parking bays, um, some yellow lines that had become faded that needed repainting. Um, so we looked to carry those out um, at the earliest opportunity. Originally, they had been um, scheduled for completion on the 18th of February. Um, but they were actually brought forward by a day because the contractor had, um, like the rest of us, was aware of storm warnings for storm units coming in, so they looked to get the works completed uh, a day earlier. The main purpose of this report is to provide the committee with an update on the locations of the footway parking areas, because um, these require um, exemptions, and for them, those exemptions to be enforceable, uh, it needs a committee resolution to support that. Um, as I said, um, there's a plan at Annex 1 which highlights the areas that we're looking uh, to cover um, in those footway parking exemption areas. Um, and given the late hour, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and happy to take any questions, Jeff. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'll um, move to um, any public comments on the issue. We did have one registered speaker, Mr Graham, but I think he's left unfortunately, and we didn't get his question in writing. So, um, but if anyone um, has got any comments at all that they want to bring forward? No, members of the committee? Okay, thank you very much. So I'll now move from the chair, the recommendations at the front of the report on page C1. The committee is asked to resolve that the works be carried out to the disabled bays at number 10 Clayton Road and number 43 Clayton Road and the repainting of the double yellow lines outside 120 and 122 Clayton Road be noted and two, the proposed minor amendments to the footway parking arrangements in the parts of Clayton Road shown in Annex 1 and as detailed in paragraphs 9 to 11 be exempted from the footway parking ban under the provisions of section 15 of the GLC General Powers Act 1974 and that these exemptions come into force on the 28th of March 2022. Do I have a seconder for that please? Yep. Councillor Young, thank you very much. Um, so can, um, can we, all those in favour, raise your hands. Okay, that's lovely, that's unanimous, thank you very much. So we'll go to the planned highway maintenance programme 2022-2023. And members of the committee and meeting participants may refer to Appendix D of the Agenda Pack. The committee is asked to consider the programme set out in Annex 1 and provide any comments for consideration by the Place Committee as it's meeting on 10th of March. We have in attendance tonight, and I'm so sorry to have kept you so late and so long, Sonny. Um, so I'll ask you to introduce the report, if I may. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, the main purpose of this uh, planned highway maintenance program 2022-23 uh, is basically to consult the neighbourhood committee and if any comment I will be taken away and, and reported back to the assistant director for the place committee on um, on the 10th of March, which is two, two night times. Uh, so you don't have to make any decision on this. I, I don't think we're not asking for any decision on, on this uh, plan. But, but uh, if, you ha if you have a look at the uh, Annex 1, uh, we have identified um, for South of the Borough, we have identified three carriageway, uh, Clayton Road, Park Road, Hunter Road, and Church Lane on page 1 of Annex 1. And the footway is uh, Mount Road, a section of Mount Road that the footway needs to be reconstructed. We identify these uh, checking on the condition that they are really bad, that basically our normal reactive maintenance um, is beyond the, 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 the daily repair. And all. It, it needs a full um, servicing or, 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 or reconstruction part of the footway to make it safe for local residents and other highway users. So uh, if, if any comment or any uh, question, then I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you, Sonny. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for the um, 
repairs on Mount Road, been pushing for this for 10 years, so that is a really, really good good news for the residents there, as I say, it is 10 years, been pushing for that. Um, and the other thing is that the Clayton Road repairs, when the uh, contractors from the equestrian centre were moving the, the or earth, when the uh, equestrian centre was being levelled, Part of the agreement, the, the agreement uh, allowing them to use Clayton Road, which incidentally we all objected to, but nonetheless, part of the agreement to allow them to use Clayton Road is that they would be responsible for making the road good after that. And a lot of damage occurred to the footway and to the roadway, and to the roadway during this process. Have they been approached to fund it? Uh, as far as I know, no, Councillor. <laughs> yeah. Um. We, we haven't approached anyone. I mean, we identified how badly damaged this section of the carriageway is. It is, the, and that's yeah. because of the heavy lorries carrying the um, the, yeah. the spoil up, and up Clayton I Road. Mean, I, I and make, part of the note, agreement but, made at the time was that but, they would be responsible for maintaining the carriageway after it had finished. But the problem, I don't think, you know, I don't know how, how can we approach them to make them pay this, because they probably say that they're using the public highways and... Okay, thank you. It is part of the. It was part of the planning application. So perhaps I don't know if a conversation could be held um, with yourselves and the planning team um, that it should have been part. It was part of the conditions within the planning application yeah, exactly. that they would pick up. I, Ian, did you want to come in? Yeah, I, I mean, I. It, it does kind of ring a bell now that Councillor Thompson has, has mentioned it. Um, and, I, and I know my former colleague Peter Johnson would, would probably be, be squirming if he was sat here right now thinking about um, the, the, the various sort of like vehicles that trundled up and down Clayton Road. Um, I think our, our, our challenge might be that they would want us to evidence what the road was like when they finished and what it's like now. And, you know, it, it would be in the intervening period what other traffic has, has been using the road that might have also contributed to, to the condition that it's in. But, it, you know, I, that's... The, if I were them, that would be the position I would take, but I'm more than happy for us to go back and to pressure them. But because I, if we I, I don't think, ask, we won't get it, no, we? <laughs> Absolutely. I think I'm just, I was just cautioning that um, it, it might not be an easy... I think it would be a good challenge um, simply to throw it back at them in that... Um, there would undoubtedly have been damage made by those vehicles and therefore even if they if they weren't going to pay for the full amount because perhaps it wasn't picked up at the end of the the, the they should be paying something towards it if nothing else so i think we we have a challenge from that point of view thank you mr rob um so i think yeah, but i think we should we should try thank you very much Anyone else got any comments for this report to be taken to place committee? I'm sorry that you've um, had, to, had to stay so late, but it seems that there's not many comments to take back. But thank you very much indeed, Sonny. And I hope you don't have too much of a late night on Thursday. Thank you very much. If you wish to leave, you're more than welcome to. Um, so we'll go on to um, item 14 on the agenda on the neighbourhood boundary arrangements. Members of the committee and meeting participants may refer to Appendix E of the agenda pack. The committee is asked to comment upon the draft proposals for new boundaries set out in paragraph 6 of the report. Our comments will be forwarded to Corporate and Resources Committee on 24th of March. Um, I'll now invite if anyone... Um, Oh, I th um, Mr. Rob, I think you've indicated you wanted to speak on this one. Thank you. We on the way? Yes. Um, well, first of all, there's um, there's no p p sorry there's no p in the word community, and there's no p in the words um, south of the borough, right? Uh, so. Uh, we shouldn't be constructing these boundaries on, for political reasons. We should be doing them for community reasons. Now, um, we've shown tonight, and I couldn't think of a better example, it's like a quadrat demonstrandum, that the boundaries should stop at the A3. Uh, to the west 
it should be Elmbridge and Claygate. To the east, it should be the A240, uh, chopping off Liddles, the, the Premier Inn um, and Tower Station, and go, go to the houses, uh, the, the, the actual real houses all, at the moment, in Hook Rise South. And um, we're, we're an urban area, we're not suburban at the moment, hopefully, and we've got a, a, a mixture of some great industrial business parks. So the, the, our boundary should be, the, A3, the south of the borough should be the ward. And the bit of, a, bit of a, it's shown tonight that that should be part of Tolworth because you've actually shown what the problems it's causing by not collectively looking at the problem overall. Could I just come back on that, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah. If we did it that way, that would mean that King George's and Sunray Ward would be split over two neighbourhoods. Uh, but I'm just making a plea for the South of the Borough community. You know, it just makes... Um, I mean, the A240 is a major boundary. The A3 is a major boundary. And I, w I, would, I would actually argue that, you know, our concerns... Um, uh, I mean, the, the, there's pr we had a war meeting with the police uh, from Tolworth, uh, um, uh, and it showed that really um, our problems aren't really what Tolworth problems are. You know, so that doesn't work either. But we are the South of the Borough. I'd like it to be the parish council or the south of Borough, but it won't happen. But, uh, you know, um, uh, I strongly feel that the changes will be detrimental. And in fact, we should look at um, the community's boundaries and not political boundaries. Thank you very much. I, I'd say my only concern with that would be... Yeah, but that's a problem for them. ...splitting you know? a ward, um, so that would make it quite difficult for decision-making. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, but, yeah, but what I'm yeah. saying to you is... Uh, you're, you're talking politically. No, 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 not at all. If I'm talking about a ward, yeah, but some, keeping Sunray, a t community together, yeah, but you've the sun, got a The Sunray sun belongs to, to Tolworth. Anyway, I appreciate your comments. I, I mean, you've right. got the um, Guinness Partnership um, thing going on. Uh, that's high density, how, and, and, and that's definitely, really, all they talked about was um, part of the, the Tolworth Broad and that sort of thing. They didn't talk about being part of the South of the Borough, you know. So uh, they don't, uh, they're, not, they're not part of our borough. We don't think, we don't, I don't think, and many of our think, we don't think uh, Tolworth is part of the South of the Borough. Thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Kirsch. Thanks, you, Mr. Rob, for your comments. I just really wanted to briefly touch upon the point. Uh, this was not about politics or, or, or something like that. It's We had a restructure of the boards and with the new boards, which uh, we made all representations, various people made representations. The end of the decision of the uh, Boundary Commission, they came up with uh, the final way. And so we have to live with the new boards. And uh, with finding new uh, neighbourhoods uh, wasn't easy or isn't easy or uh, wasn't easy and there was no nothing in relation to politics but nobody obviously wanted to split like uh, Councillor Dunstan said a, a ward in, in between or putting some parts of one of the new boards into one neighbourhood and other parts in the other what, what we uh, started with is the aim that at least all that we are not splitting wards for neighbourhoods and so that has nothing to do with any any politics and was a hard decision between suburban and neighbourhood and south of the world neighbourhood how we how we uh, how we save this or how we we, we we come up with the new neighbourhoods it wasn't easy but every aspect you look at I mean like doctor surgeries and all that sort of thing uh, it, it doesn't work you know the, these boundaries the south of the borough works it's a, it's brilliant you know right the, right the way down to Morden Russia. We are, we are the south of the borough. We have our this south of the committee. You know, we've shown tonight shouldn't include bits of uh, above the A3 because they need to talk to each other because they're affected by things that happen above them more than we affect them. You know, the, it, it, the A3 is, is a definite boundary. And, you know, and and I can't I can't see the logic. I, I know it'll happen anyway, but I just can't see the logic. And uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rob. Anyone else got any comments at all that they'd like yeah. to put forward? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, as um, chair of the committee, I, can, I will bring ahead because I'll be sitting on that committee and I'll be able to pull, pull that uh, comment through at that point as well. Thank you very much. So, the... the I think, as this has been aired, the the alternative was, in fact, to include in 
the south of the borough, a large chunk of Tolworth. So we we, we have I, I'm I'm at a loss to apart from the sun ray, which is slightly different. It is south of the borough. Unless, unless, uh, I'm getting confused at the map. We are, we are south of the borough. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we'll go to urgent items authorised by the chair. Um, I have no um, urgent items. Um, go to item for information items, uh, potential forthcoming business and traffic schemes updates. Is there anything to add to that tonight? No? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions at all? Um, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, so if we've got nothing to else to add, before I close the meeting, um, obviously this is the last South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee meeting um, of this municipal year. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to all colleagues. Um, you've been fantastic. Um, I've really enjoyed working with you, um, each and every one of you. Um, I'm not, I, I can say now, I'm not actually going to be standing at the next election, so I wish every single one of you the best of luck. Um, thank you to Richard for, for being there every single step of the way and any concerns that I constantly ring him about. Ah! Um, so thank you very much. To Democratic Services, you've been fantastic and I really appreciate all your help. Ian, um, all the officers um, have been very supportive and very helpful with all the information that came forward. So I just wanted to say thank you and thank you to the residents, obviously, because without us, without you guys, we won't be here. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Thompson, did you want to come in? Yeah, I've, I echo everything, of course, that Lorraine has said. I'm standing down after 12 years as a councillor. I will miss it hugely. I've loved being part of um, this community. But I would also like to pay a special tribute to Lorraine, who has been an absolutely outstanding neighbourhood chair. As I say, I've been a councillor 12 years. I've seen a lot of neighbourhood chairs. And she is absolutely outstanding and has always given so freely of her time and energy. She has a full-time job a family and she does this and I do not know how she finds that many hours in a day so thank you so much Lorraine for all you have done thank you thank you very much <laughs> councillor Kirsch yeah, thank you chair um, I uh, more or less wanted to say the same than Margaret <laughs> you have been an outstanding uh, chair and I think I speak for everybody else here so uh, really 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 a huge thank you I've done this for four years now uh, for the whole uh, administration and you have been an inspiration uh, to everyone I think and definitely to me and uh, also yeah when I started four years ago as a, a freshly elected new councillor and uh, started uh, being vice chair of neighborhood under your guidance and that was massively helpful so without that I wouldn't now be where I am at the moment so a huge huge thanks and you have been a really brilliant neighborhood chair for all these years. Thank you very much, Councillor Tan. And this is nothing as a bit of an appreciation for Aidan. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I'd like to add to what my colleague said. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lorraine's been great. Not only a neighbourhood chair, as my colleague in my ward. Um, I really uh, uh, appreciate your uh, support and all what you have done for the ward and to help me as well. Um, it's nearly eight years. And it's been great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for all your support. And to all the colleagues and who are not standing. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's so kind. And I'm, uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You never know, I might be back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go through it again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, so if no one else has got any comments, I will close the meeting. Thank you very much. And that's at 22.58. And I'm sorry that was the last meeting where it was really late. And I'm sorry about that. But anyway, thank you very much, everyone.